She said she might not be. Okay. Good evening. I'm Kalamazoo Deputy City Manager Jeff Chamberlain and welcome tonight to tonight's Kalamazoo City Commission meeting of September 21, 2020. Tonight's meeting is being streamed live on the city's Facebook page, and it's also being streamed on the city's YouTube channel. You can listen on, to your, on your phone by calling area code 269-552-6425 and entering meeting ID number uh, 930-8905-1754 when prompted. And you may also leave a three minute public comment for tonight's meeting by calling area code 269-226-6573. And with that, I would like to turn it over to Kalamazoo Mayor David Anderson. Thank you very much, uh, Deputy City Manager Jeff Chamberlain. I appreciate it. Welcome to this regular business meeting via Zoom of the City Commission meeting for Monday, September 21st, 2020. So I'm officially calling this meeting to order. Clerk Borling, would you please call the roll? Commissioner Cunningham. Here. Commissioner Hess. Present. Commissioner Knott. Commissioner Pradle. Present. Commissioner Urban. Here. Vice Mayor Griffin. Here. Mayor Anderson. Here. Is there a motion to excuse Commissioner Knott? So moved. Motion made by Commissioner Cunningham. Second. Supported by Commissioner Hess. All those in favor, please say yes. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes the absent commissioner is excused. For our opening ceremony tonight, we are honored to have Pastor Brett Sarah, I hope I'm saying that right. That's correct, yep. Uh, we are honored to have you here from the Kalamazoo Seventh-day Adventist Church for our invocation, Pastor. Amen. If you'd like to join me for prayer, we'll pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this um, wonderful meeting. We pray for our leaders. We ask that you may give them great wisdom and discernment. And we thank you for placing them in this position we pray for our city. We pray for safety, for love and equality, and opportunity for everybody. And we thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you for that very much. Good to have you on with us. Commissioners, uh, you have before you the agenda for tonight's meeting. Are there any changes you'd like to see? All right, seeing none. Uh, next, I guess, is uh, communications. Anything? And Jaritsma. Nothing, Your Honor. All right. Uh, now is time for public comment. These are general public comments. This is the way we're doing it uh, primarily now on our Zoom meetings. And Jeff will take care of that. Uh, Jeff, do we have comments tonight? Yes, we do. And these are all the general comments. So under your revised rules, uh, these are the comments that have come in for uh, any of the regular agenda items or any items in general. So with that, we will, we will play those items for you tonight. tonight. Jeff Messer, city resident. Today is the third Monday of September, a date on which Sean Fletcher and his parks department was trying to establish a new tradition of an annual outdoor city commission meeting when meetings were held in Hayes Park in 2017 Davis Street Park in 2018. Rockwell Park was scheduled to host in 2019, but that event never materialized. Outdoor meetings are one of at least two ways the commission could reopen its meetings to the public, which have been 100% virtual for six months now. Mayor Anderson says the reason why the meetings remain 100% virtual is Governor Whitmer's order, which limits indoor social gatherings to a maximum of 10 people. I object to the classification of public government meetings as social gatherings. A public meeting is a controlled and supervised environment, not a drunken college party. I would like to hear Attorney Robinson address the legal limitations on public meetings in Michigan under the governor's orders. The second option for reopening city commission meetings to the public is hybrid meetings, which I brought to the commission's attention two months ago during your meeting on July 20. 
that followed the Portage City Council's first hybrid meeting on Tuesday, July 14. Since then, the City of Portage has held an additional four hybrid meetings for, of its City Council. In addition, they are also holding hybrid meetings for the Planning Commission and Zoning Board of Appeals. Further, the Kalamazoo County Road Commission is also holding hybrid meetings. If the City of Portage can do it, why not Kalamazoo? I think the City of Kalamazoo is looking for excuses to not open its meetings to the public, which will likely make this the least transparent term of the Kalamazoo City Commission ever. The City of Portage keeps its council chamber's occupancy low by having citizens occupy the lobby and enter the chamber when called upon. Anyone who wants to see how Portage conducts a meeting can watch archive video online at portagemi.vibit.com. That's portagemi.vibit.com. The city of Kalamazoo could hold its hybrid meetings in the following way. Have the mayor, city manager, city clerk, two other commissioners in attendance with the rest of the commission and city staff joining the meeting virtually. That would allow four citizens to occupy the chamber. An additional 10 citizens could overflow to the community room and watch the meeting on video screens there and be able to enter the chamber one at a time when called upon. The commission needs to get to work on reopening the meetings because I believe the Unlock Michigan petition drive will be successful. This means the 1945 Emergency Powers of the Governor Act, from which Gretchen Whitmer draws her unilateral powers, will be repealed. The 1976 Act will then take over, which requires the governor to seek reauthorization of emergency powers from the legislature every 28 days. If they are unable to come to terms, all of her executive orders issued under the act will expire, including the one that is allowing the Kalamazoo City Commission to commit ongoing violations of the Michigan Open Meetings Act. So Commissioner, uh, so during Commissioner comment, I'd like to hear Mayor Anderson address the options for reopening Kalamazoo City Commission meetings to the public. Thank you. Hi, this is Wendy Fields. I do live in the city of Kalamazoo. Um, I'm speaking on behalf of the Metropolitan Kalamazoo branch of the NAACP, of which I'm president. Uh, just like to start with a quote. Take a long, hard look down the road you will have to travel once you have made a commitment to work for change. Know that this transformation will not happen right away. Change often takes time. It really happens. It rarely happens all at once. In the movement, we didn't have, how, we didn't know how history would play itself out. When we were getting arrested, waiting in jail, or standing in unmovable lines on the courthouse steps, we didn't know what would happen. We knew it had to happen. And so, with that, I just want to um, echo kudos to uh, Clerk Broiling and Commissioner Prado for their uh, hard work in um, supporting this resolution, expanding voting access. Um, NAACP stands strong behind this resolution. Um, we know that uh, anything that we can do to help eliminate barriers to voting, we are there to help in any way that we might be able to. So with that, again, thank you to the commission and everybody that was involved in making this happen. Thank you. Bye-bye. Hi. Um, this is Darren Timoney. I live within the city of Kalamazoo. I'm calling in regards to the discussion and debate about the 198 abatement for graphic packaging company. I've been working in the community for 30 plus years supporting various business and community efforts. I do think that it would be very unwise of the city not to work to approve this abatement for this business. And my concern relies on it's, they are certainly bringing a significant number of investment and jobs to our community. They've been a responsible corporate citizen and will continue to be and work to alleviate some of the concerns, but the biggest issue will be if this is turned down, it'll just be a total um, challenge for the city going forward to get any serious investment of any company to make in our community. Thank you. Hi, this is Jessica Swartz with Voters Not Politicians. I'm just calling in to thank the clerk and Commissioner Pradle for all of their hard work on the voting access bill and I look forward to collaborating um, to get this done. Once again, thank you so much. Bye. This is Mary Kay Olean Berkey, 664 Winding Oaks, City of Kalamazoo. 
I'm the co-president of the League of Women Voters of the Kalamazoo area, and I'm calling in support of the resolution approving a plan to expand voting and registration access beyond the minimum required by the Michigan Constitution for the November 3rd, 2020 election. The League of Women Voters is a national nonpartisan organization that encourages active and informed citizen participation in government. The League of Women Voters does not support or oppose any candidate or political party. We encourage voting and support any opportunities for making voting easier for all of those who are eligible to vote. Expanding the office hours of the clerk during October allows greater access to voter registration and early in-person voting with an absentee ballot. The open hours on evenings and weekends offer convenience for working families. Opening a city clerk branch office on the campus of Western Michigan University will make it much easier for students to register to vote and obtain and return their absentee ballots. And making the branch office available to all city voters adds to the convenience of the clerk's services. Providing return postage on absentee ballots is yet another way this resolution makes voting easier. No one has to be concerned with having postage available or wondering if they've affixed adequate postage on their absentee ballot. If additional ballot drop boxes can be installed for this election, it will make the absentee ballot return process even easier, and it will add to the convenience of future elections as well. The League of Women Voters of the Kalamazoo area strongly supports the resolution approving the expansion of voting and registration access for the November 3rd, 2020 election. Thank you. Hello, my name is Denise Keel. I reside at 545 North Berkeley in Kalamazoo Township. I'm coming tonight on two issues. First, to support the voter resolution and second, to raise some concerns about the graphic packaging expansion. Uh, first, in my formal role as co-chair of We Vote, WMU's nonpartisan voter registration, education, and turnout initiative, I fully support the resolution approving the expansion of voting and registration access for the November 3rd, 2020 election. A fundamental goal in higher education is to prepare students for thoughtful citizenship and participation in democratic society. A starting point for this participation is voting, yet many students are effectively disenfranchised. Increased clerk business hours, increased number of Dropbox locations, and a branch location on the WMU campus will significantly help thousands of student voters this year. For many of these first-time voters, this resolution will help them to make voting a lifelong habit. We Vote is committing to helping implement and providing the voter education necessary to make this initiative as successful as possible. We look forward to the public forum after the election to continue to find ways to work with our amazing clerk's office to increase access for all voters. Broncos, please vote early. Uh, second, and now I'm, I'm commenting only uh, on my own behalf as a citizen, uh, Kalamazoo has a, a long history and legacy of industrial pollution. And in consideration of the resolution approving an industrial facilities exemption for Graphic Packaging International, I urge the commission to please consider three things in your discussion tonight. The Environmental Concerns Committee recommendation that efforts to resolve the long-standing ongoing nuisance order need to be met with concrete steps. Second, the days of tax breaks for bringing businesses and jobs into Kalamazoo should be over, or they should be over for at least firms that contribute to pollution. Perhaps that tax break could be at least reduced. And finally, please consider that the increases in the greenhouse gas pollution will impact our ability to live up to the climate emergency declarations passed last year and should spur us toward the rapid adoption of a climate action plan so that requests like these can be more fully considered within a strategic approach to carbon neutrality. Thank you very much. Hello, my name is Alex Lawrence and I live at 3535 Kenbrook Court in the city of Kalamazoo and I'm also a student at Western Michigan University. I am calling the City of Kalamazoo Board of Commissioners tonight to urge them to support the uh, resolution that Clerk Borling and Commissioner Pradle have introduced, which would add 16 open service hour, office hours beyond Proposal 18-3 requirements. Return postage for absentee ballots, a satellite clerk's office at WMU's campus, and four ballot drop boxes. 
Additional clerk office hours beyond normal business hours will help to increase the accessibility of our city clerk's office in the final week leading up to the election. A satellite clerk office will serve historically disenfranchised voters and ballot drop boxes will eliminate concerns about the post office not being able to handle the expected volume of ballots. Proposal 3 passed by a margin of 2 to 1 in November of 2018 and reduce the barriers for voting in the state of Michigan. Our city commission should strongly consider resolution, the resolution Court Bowling and Commissioner Prado will be presenting to, uh, to further expand voting services during the weeks leading up to the election to better serve voters in our community. Thank you for considering this proposal. My name is Deirdre Courtney and I am calling in support of the North Side and other Kalamazoo community residents that are requesting that the city of Kalamazoo and its commission reconsider a tax break for the graphic packaging company and that they require graphic packaging to put the necessary pollution protections in place for their community and employees. Polluted air contributes to severe health problems and reduces the quality of life for all those impacted. My call today is just to request that the city of Kalamazoo considers its decision in their tax breaks. Thank you. My name is Dave Maurer and I am the president of Humphrey Products Company. We are not located within the city of Kalamazoo, but we are certainly stakeholders in the economic health of the region. And many of our employees live in the city and I am personally involved in a number of initiatives within the city of Kalamazoo itself. I'm calling to ask for the commission's support of the resolution approving an industrial facilities exemption certificate for graphic packaging, significant expansion of their Kalamazoo facility. To not support this at this time will send a message to every likely site locator in North America and around the globe that Kalamazoo, Michigan cannot be depended upon to follow through on commitments made in order to secure site location preference. It will have a chilling effect on our ability to attract new manufacturers and or to retain expansion plans of those already operating within our region. More importantly, in addition to creating an unbelievably positive story linking Kalamazoo to the environmental impact of expanding the country's capacity for recycled rather than virgin packaging materials, we will also benefit as a region from the jobs that are created and from the increased footprint of a global leader that makes Kalamazoo a more critical and less expendable site within their global organization. Please approve this request. Thank you. Hi, my name is Debbie Fryman and I live on Bennington Court in Portage. I am not within the Kalamazoo city limits, but am calling to weigh in on the resolution approving an industrial facilities exemption certificate for graphic packaging international. And I hope that you'll listen to my comments because while I don't live within the city, I am a uh, patron of the city and I have lots of friends that live within the city and are affected by the decision to give the um, tax exemption to graphic packaging and encourage them and their building. While I appreciate that they have given so many people jobs and have been in the city of Kalamazoo for so long. The letter that they wrote that was published in the documents for this meeting says that they will do all kinds of things that I just think that their history shows that they have not done those kind of things. And while they do want to be a good neighbor, there's no uh, legal basis for the letter that they wrote and nothing that would hold them to do the things that they say that they're going to do. The uh, smell that the people in their neighborhood have to live with, as well as the contamination that 
seeps into their groundwater and their um, uh, soil just does not justify the city taxpayers paying for this 191 Hundred and ninety-one million dollar uh, abatement that has been offered. So, please do not approve that. Uh, thank you for your time. My name is Dorothy Appleyard, and I am a resident of the city of Kalamazoo. I'm calling to comment on agenda item H two. I vigorously oppose the approval of an industrial facilities exemption for Graphic Packaging International LLC on the grounds that one, GPI continues to produce environmental conditions that endanger the North Side neighborhood and beyond, putting the health, welfare, and economic viability of the neighborhood at risk. The job creation expected to be generated by the proposed expansion are temporary construction jobs with no guarantee that local residents will be employed. Three, based on GPI's tax exemption and the county brownfield designation, there will be no tax revenue to the city or other local taxing authorities. The city, GPI, and environmental agencies are currently engaged in monitoring and environmental studies, but we need more than another study. We need mandated results that environmental hazards are being eliminated before any exemptions are granted. We recently engaged in an intense community conversation about housing equity and racism, resulting in an adopted fair housing ordinance. Permitting GPI to continue to emit odors that make the North Side a less desirable place to live goes against the spirit of this ordinance. I urge the commission to deny the approval of the industrial facilities exemption for GPI until all environmental issues are fully resolved. Thank you. Hi, my name is Cassie and I do live within the city limits of Kalamazoo. I am calling on Jim Ritzma to resign. It appears he does not know what the, this community wants, nor is he good for us. Um, I recently reviewed, saw his email where he supports the KDPS and the chief, um, which he need, but really what they need to all do is take accountability. And since they can't do that, we, it's time to get somebody who can in there. Thank you. Goodbye. Hi, my name is David Benack and I do live within the city. I am calling to register my opposition to the granting of any public monies for graphic packaging's expansion. The, this company has a long record of contaminating our air quality, having been reported, sued, fined for that contamination, yet has chosen not to do anything significant about it. If it was an issue that was important to the company, it would have been addressed by this point. Excusing their behavior because they say that the city's wastewater treatment plant plays into that contamination is playing what about game and not fixing the solution. Instead of saying, we're polluting some, so they should pollute some, we need to say, no, they should not be polluting, and we're working on stopping our own. Graphic Packaging has applied for permits to increase their volatile organic compounds, which can be incredibly dangerous to people's health. They have asked for permits for other air contamination and for a 221% increase in their greenhouse gas emissions. If this is a city that cares about climate, which I don't think that actually is true, despite the passage of the climate emergency resolution, there has been zero real progress on a climate plan. If this is a community that cares about the health of its people, 
which does not seem to be true, considering there is a 14-year life expectancy difference between those people who live around the graphic packaging plant and those people who live in the wealthier uh, white neighborhoods of town. That has not improved. It's actually gotten worse in the past decade. So this study doesn't care about people uh, people's health. It doesn't care about minorities. It's encouraging environmental discrimination. This meeting we're also hearing is to extend this tax break. It was not approved at the 817 meeting. The resolution is online. We can read it, and we know it was not approved at that meeting. That meeting was, ta- or that uh, resolution was tabled. It was not passed. So we don't want lies. We want this voted down. Even if this is some kind of a clever plan that costs the city nothing, we should not be spending public money on this, even if there's a clever scheme. Hello, my name is Matt Smith, and I live in the city of Kalamazoo. I'm a librarian, local historian, and housing advocate. Mayor Anderson said he's been doing a lot of walking and thinking about Kalamazoo neighborhoods. That's good. Before voting on graphic packaging, I would like to suggest a walk. All of the city leaders that make policy for neighborhoods they don't live in or represent, and to be clear, I don't represent them either. I live in Vine. Please take this walk. Start at graphic packaging. Take a deep breath past Lincoln School and think about how asthma alone creates disparities in educational outcomes, disproportionately harming black children. Head west through the north side. Now, as you continue west for the next two miles through Westwood and towards Oshimo, I plead that you contemplate on why you are traveling a 14-year life expectancy gap. Why you can travel two miles from the north side and travel a 14-year increase in life expectancy. Could it be environmental racism? Nah. Can't be that. Environmental racism is white pollution harming black bodies, black brains, respiratory systems, neighborhoods. In 1924, Kalamazoo passed its first zoning ordinance. And guess where they zoned industrial? The area where black people live. And guess where that was? The area around graphic packaging. Decade later, the FHA praised this as a model ordinance for the nation. White single family zoning to the southwest. Black industrial zone to the northeast. Hazardous Negro labor, they said. Graphic packaging has been cited eight times for odor violations. A hundred residents are suing them. The reports are confusing, and there's a way to spin them that seems not that bad. Here's how this plays out every single time. Racism, 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 study, study, studies, and then, oops, sorry, we poisoned you. You need to break that cycle. The burden of proof is not on black Northsiders to prove with overwhelming evidence that you are poisoning them. The burden is on city leaders to prove overwhelmingly that the all-white billion-dollar corporation is not poisoning black Northsiders. That's where the burden of proof has to shift. If you think environmental racism is some fancy term that applies to every other industrial city in America, except then you are part of the problem. And here's what's so mind-numbing about it. On the table is not even a vote about environmental racism. It's a vote about whether you're going to give an all-white billion-dollar corporation, $21 million. Hello, my name is Emily Duguay, and I live at 132 Edgemore Avenue in the city of Kalamazoo. I'm an employee at Western Michigan University and a co-chair of We Vote, a nonpartisan organization on WMU's campus that works to increase civic engagement among students. I'm calling in to support a resolution that Clerk Borling and Commissioner Pradel plan to introduce, which will add 16 open service office hours beyond Proposal 183's requirements, return postage for absentee ballots, a satellite clerk's office at WMU's campus, and four ballot drop boxes. Additional clerk office hours beyond normal business hours will help to increase the the accessibility of our city clerk's offices in the final weeks leading up to the election, which has proven necessary for WMU student voters in recent elections. A satellite clerk office will reserve historic will, will serve historically disenfranchised voters, including first-time voters like many of WMU students. 
and ballot drop boxes will eliminate concerns about the post office not being able to handle the expected volume of absentee ballots. Proposal 3 passed by a margin of 2 to 1 in November of 2018 and reduced the barriers for voting in the state of Michigan. Our city commission should strongly consider the resolution Clerk Borling and Commissioner Pradle plan to present to further expand voting services during the weeks leading up to the election to better serve voters in our community. Thank you for considering this proposal. This is Joe Byers. I'm a city resident living in the Vine neighborhood. Since 1867, graphic packaging has been practicing, along with the help from the city, environmental racism and terrorism by pumping pollution and toxins into our city in predominantly black and brown neighborhoods. That's 153 years. Now, they want another tax break to, con to continue to poison city residents. According to a response I received from Mr. Urban, the tax break is already a foregone conclusion. My guess is that it's thanks to the billionaires and corporations' favorite ex-mayor, Bobby Hopewell's, backroom dealings with MEDC. Mr. Urban's response also included, and I quote, with no graphic packaging operations in Kalamazoo, we still could have odor issues at the wastewater treatment plant. Much better to have economic activity provided by their plant and have the odor problem fixed. So basically what he's saying, money and economic activity is more valuable than lives in our environment. So I'm asking that the lowest possible time be approved for this tax abatement. How can any one of you with a straight face say black lives matter when you support this blatant racism? Graphic packaging has been a bad faith partner to our city for as long as I can remember. Now they have a class action lawsuit pending by city residents Odors continue to plague our city. They want to further degrade our fragile Kalamazoo River watershed by killing 700 city trees. And if that's not enough for these environmental terrorist criminals, they have an application to the state to be able to increase greenhouse gas emissions by 221%. We are in the middle of a climate crisis and it's starting to spin out of control and they want to increase pollution. The city passed the climate emergency resolution last year and what has happened since then? Where is the climate plan? What are you all waiting for? Or was it just a performance to get a new mayor elected? I will not stand by while big business and this commission allows all living things to die and harm our most vulnerable in the name of economic activity. One quick note about Kalamazoo Public Safety. I applaud the decision for Chief Thomas to step down. However, the city will not forget that Mr. Coakley unleashed weapons of war on our black youth earlier this summer, right after Neil. So we will be watching uh, the same, with the same scrutiny uh, that we did with Chief Thomas. Thank you. Hey, it's Brandy Crawford Johnson. You all know who I am. North Side resident in the city of Kalamazoo, Michigan. And I'm uh, calling to say that we have a saying in the hood called make it make sense. And that's all I've been doing since June 30th of this year. You know, I had my suspicions when I was on the environmental concerns committee about the air quality. And I find out you sent a cease and desist letter to the Lung Association. So I knew you didn't care. But I got lied to by the state saying that everything was fine, but it wasn't because you're leaking hydrogen sulfide and sulfur dioxide that is causing many of our health issues in the north and east side neighborhoods. And you did it because they're predominantly African-American and you're either being bullied or you're scared. I don't know, but you need to put all that aside and know that everybody over here, we're all human beings. We have children, we have, we have families. Many of our, many, many people that have grown up here have lost family members because they have never used filters on those smokestacks and 30 toxic chemicals have been released. Not telling the leaks that they didn't want to fix. And you know what? You guys try to act like it just came out in June. No, I found a report from 2009. So y'all been knowing about this. And this is absolutely ridiculous. And you should never get them a $21 million tax break today. You need to tell them to shut down because they're not only poisoning us, they're poisoning all of you. And you guys really need to stop. 
allowing companies to just come and poison people like this. Like every, every, I hope every city and county member hears me all over the world. You guys need to stop letting polluters pollute you. You should want them to use pollution prevention. If the state doesn't do their job, you need to go to the EPA because that's what I've been doing. And they're not working fast enough either. We should, we should, we shouldn't have to even be worried about having air purifiers in our houses. This is ridiculous. We should be able to breathe clean air outside with our children during a pandemic, for God's sake. I have to sell my house for way less than it would be worth, just so I can leave it only to an investor. Stop this. Help us, please. Is that good? Hello, my name is Jennifer Cantley, and I am a member of Mom's Clean Air Force. And I am calling today on behalf of Kalamazoo and with a request of why is this city allowing pollution to be spewing through the air of gases that are contaminating your members' lungs in your community. This, to me, resembles closely to what the Nazis did to the Jews and putting them in gas chambers, except this is a slower death. This should not be acceptable. When you learn about what these gases do to people's lungs and inflammation to their eyes and throats and necks and that you are aware that this is happening and that you are not doing anything to filter it or to help in any way, not even having an air monitoring system within the location to see how much pollution is in the air, it is beyond appalling. I ask you to step up for every citizen in this community as we are all dealing with mental stress with COVID as it is. For these citizens to not even be able to walk outside to get the stress off of their backs when they have asthma or COPD or just any other air lung issue, it is ridiculous. I'm asking for this city and state to step up and take care of their citizens and know that moms are watching across the country. Hi, my name is Elizabeth. Um, I am gravely concerned, um, and I would like to know who is responsible for holding Graphic Packaging International responsible for the pollution that is occurring in our neighborhoods and are making our children sick, um, causing asthma attacks. We can't even go outside right now during a pandemic. And I just want to know why a organization or a company that has had um, eight violations um, for polluting us um, is being allowed to expand at this time, making us all sicker. So I'd like to know who exactly do I need to um, uh, highlight who is responsible for this. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Amber Adams Fall, and I'm a former resident of Kalamazoo and current resident of Parchment, and both my husband and I work in Kalamazoo. I'm calling again this evening since I've been calling and writing for over a month now regarding statements that were made in your August 17th Zoom City Commission meeting. It has been another two, full two weeks since I have gotten any response from any of you, and I'm continuing to make the same specific request of you. In your August 17th meeting, Commissioner Aaron Knott made a false statement that Reverend Nathan Dannison had personally contacted armed PDL protest protesters to attend his peaceful prayer vigil during the Proud Boys rally. There is substantial proof that the statement Commissioner not made was false. And I have seen no attempt from her or anyone on the commission to provide proof that her statements were accurate. She also referred to the Reverend as a race baiter, which is a highly inflammatory term, and blamed him for a significant portion of the mishandling of the events that took place that weekend. These statements have caused significant unwarranted damage to Mr. Dannison's reputation and continue to endanger the safety of himself, his wife, and his children. It wasn't okay that these statements were made, and I honestly can't for the life of me understand why you are still completely unwilling to accept, address, or repair your mistake. I am continuing to ask for one simple thing, that Commissioner not correct her misstatement of the facts and that a public apology be issued by her to Mr. Dannison for the direct and intentional slander of his name and defamation of his character 
and to the public for spreading false information from a position of power. I will again politely state that this is not acceptable for an elected official to publicly make false claims or engage in behavior that endangers the safety of one's own constituents. I am sure that you're quite tired of hearing from me by now, and I'm honestly shocked by your continued disregard of this matter. To each of you that have stood by and watched this happen, your silence represents complicity. And if I have to, I will continue to call into every meeting and send regular emails until this situation has been repaired and the damage has been curtailed by an apology. Your job is to care about the people who are in your community who have elected you. You have caused significant harm to many people in this regard, and you really need to fix it. Mayor Anderson, I look forward to a response to the email I sent you two weeks ago in which you offered to speak with me and then did not respond further. I'm hoping to see this issue addressed in tonight's meeting. I will be watching and I will keep calling in if I need to. Uh, hello, my name is Andy Argo. I'm a city of Kalamazoo resident. Uh, first, I wanted to thank the entire commission for uh, voting unanimously for the housing equity ordinance. Uh, I know a lot of people were doing a lot of good work on that for a very long time. Um, I'm excited to see some good stuff uh, coming out of the city. Um, I was also calling, um, it's almost kind of a response to the, the new leadership at Kalamazoo Department of Public Safety. Um, wanted to emphasize a couple things uh, for, uh, you know, soon to be Chief uh, Coakley. Uh, I'm sincerely hoping that there is going to be more actual dialogue uh, with people in the community about uh, policing in general, but also uh, feedback to specific events. Um, one of the things that still distresses me about the events in June and more recently of August 15th is uh, there really has not been, um, at least as far as I can tell, a lot of that kind of direct communication about uh, how things should have done better, um, actually like internalizing criticism with next steps, it's one thing to apologize. It's even one thing to, you know, see a resignation. But unless uh, actual plans uh, are put forth, um, it's it's really not worth a whole lot. Um, and again, we can go specifically back to you know things that would have been better practices in those days. Um, I've been very vocal about that on social media. Um, Again, I'm really befuddled at why, uh, you know, Kalamazoo Public Safety couldn't do uh, precisely what they did about a decade and a half ago with the KKK, you know, physically separating the crowds. Uh, I'm also stupefied uh, more about why tear gas was used uh, back in early June. But again, um, I think those are conversations that need to happen. Um, I also specifically wanted to reference the task force um, uh, that was built in response uh, to the 15th. I believe it's Patrice, Chris, and um, Eric who are on it. Um, I'm very curious about the progress of that. And um, also specifically, one thing I'm worried about is, is this in the context of dealing with future incursions from fascist, violent fascist hate groups or protests in general? Because, um, you know, the first part of that, um, coming up with an actual plan for when these violent hate groups threaten our city or come in. That is so, so important and extremely timely with everything that's happened nationally since August 15th. The groups all over the country are getting very nervous about violence that might erupt, uh, you know, during the election and after, and the city needs to take that seriously, certainly more seriously than it did the 15th. Thank you very much and have a good night. Hello, my name is Rick Fryman. I live in the neighboring community of Portage. And I heard about the uh, the issue with uh, Graphic Packaging International and their tax exemption, and uh, that about the uh, the odors and the hydrogen sulfide in the air. Um, hydrogen sulfide being a cancer-causing type of of uh, chemical, uh, which is you can smell at lower concentrations, but in higher concentrations you don't even smell it. Um, there's been engineering studies on these with a, a recommendation for remediation. And uh, I, I think that uh, before a, a tax exemption should be granted to uh, this company, uh, although they're they a very helpful company uh, to the city, uh, the tax exemption should at least be postponed. 
and, uh, and made contingent on implementing the odor control system that was recommended by Jones and Henry engineers in their June 20th report. Thank you. My name is Richard Stewart. I am a resident of the city. I still need any commissioner to instruct city staff to accept Southtown neighborhoods um, neighborhood plan so that we can be a part of the development of our neighborhood. The Southtown neighborhood would be the 23rd neighborhood um, and we've run into nothing but obstacles, no assistance with our plan and you're moving forward as if we don't exist, but we do exist. It takes just one commissioner to instruct staff to accept our plan, and we'd like to submit it just like the other neighborhoods have. Thank you. Hi, everyone. My name is Corinne Rutkowski. I'm a volunteer with Voters Not Politicians, and I'm also a resident of the Stewart neighborhood. And I'm calling to thank the commission and in particular Commissioner Pradle for your support of the resolution for expanding clerk services for future elections. There's really broad community support for these expanded services and it's critical this year more than ever that we make voting accessible and safe for all Kalamazoo residents. So thank you so much for your support. My name is Diana McMunn and I do live in the Kalamazoo city limits. I have lived here all of my adult life, and I'm calling because I've sat through several of these meetings where folks from all over everywhere but Kalamazoo want to call and weigh in, starting by telling us how much money they spend in our town, like that should be able to buy them an opinion. And I really hope that we remember that their opinion is not relevant when it comes to voting for what the citizens of Kalamazoo want. Thank you. Hi, my name is Morgan Ergood. I'm a WMU alumni that lives within Kalamazoo city limits. I am vehemently opposed to giving graphic packaging international a tax break. And I think that the city should look more into how it's infecting our environment and making this city kind of a laughing stock for taking care of its citizens. I am very disappointed to say that I I'm living in a town and chose to live in a town that is not taking care of its lower income citizens and not taking environmental quality seriously. I think there's a lot of talk and no action. Stephen, you're good. I live within Parchment and I'm calling because I disapprove of graphic packaging and what they are trying to do, especially in the red line parts of the city, polluting the city, uh, making lives harder than they already are. And just because they can get away with it, that's what they're going to do. I do not approve of that. And uh, I will not stand for that. And I will be doing everything in my power to make sure that does not happen. And you should too. Thank you. Uh, my name is Santiago. I live within the city limits of Kalamazoo. And I'm calling to comment on the ongoing review of the uh, police uh, actions in June and in August uh, with the protests by the Black Lives Matter uh, movement as well as by the uh, Proud Boys uh, racist militia, procuring the resignation of the chief of police, asking her to fall on her sword without demanding the same from the civilians further up the chain of command, whether they're elected or civil servants is yet another instance of the incompetence exhibited in dealing with the public protest in June and in August of this year. Furthermore, I requested a copy of the review being conducted on those events a whole two weeks ago, and it has yet to arrive. I trust that the report, when it does arrive, will include scientific journal evidence as well as newspaper clippings about how similar pro protests are handled in other cities and in other countries that do a much better job than the people here in Kalamazoo who expect on-the-job training and be paid for their uh, lack of ability. Hi, this is Melody. I'm calling Melody Dakin. I'm calling live in the city of Kalamazoo. 
Um, I'm calling tonight to just talk about a few issues I've just noticed throughout the last few months. Um, just complicity in perpetuating white supremacy. All these issues that we've been talking about tonight and past weeks, you know, the issues with KDPS, the Proud Boys coming to town, graphic packaging, housing, all has to do with perpetuating white supremacy. And you, as all commissioners and leaders of the city, are causing harm making the decisions that you're making. You are causing harm. And I really encourage you, especially Jim Ritzma, to examine the decisions you're making and really look at the harm you are causing and the complicity you are causing. And your the decisions that you're making are you're supporting white people, <laughs> perpetuating and gaining wealth and leaving so many people behind to die. And just, it's not good. And I really look to you, Jim, and to these big power holders, especially the city commission, it's on you. Like we are looking to you and we need you to step up. Patrice Griffin, Eric Cunningham, you're doing amazing work. I'm going to continue to support you. Thank you so much, Patrice. Um, I just want to support you. You're saying you're asking good questions, and I just appreciate you all for all the hard work and um, amazing leadership you're doing. Everyone else, I really look on you to step up. Um, please. Thank you. Yeah, this is Stephen Tavares. I live in the Vine neighborhood. I have lived in this neighborhood since I moved here 12 years ago. And I used to visit Kalamazoo as a child. And around the graphic packaging area, I had relatives, one of the few Mexicans that lived on that side of town, by the way. And the air quality back then, 25, 30 years ago, was atrocious. And it's still atrocious today. And as much money and tax relief and tax abatements and all the tax incentives that you provide an employer, and I understand that's important, but basically the odor has not gotten better. The air quality does not seem to have gotten any better since the time that I moved here. And now I'm understanding that there is a deal done already to give them the everything they need to be able to build without taking care of the problems that they create ongoing. Come on, City of Kalamazoo representatives and commissioners and employees. I don't understand. You know, either the commission is going to take a stronger stance against staff deciding what's good for Kalamazoo or the elected officials are. You know, this weak form of government we have as commissioners is for the birds. I want to know who's actually deciding for the benefit of Kalamazoo of who gets to benefit. So far, it doesn't seem as though the city staff care much for the health and welfare of the community. Second, I want to again address, and I'm glad that our former chief or soon to be former chief is gone. But what about the rest of you? Every day I see more and I hear more about these little passive aggressive comments about the residents of Kalamazoo coming from people who are supposed to represent us. I'm embarrassed for all of you. You know, my only solution is to hopefully somebody's going to get the courage to decide we need to elect by precinct. This popularity contest of winner takes all elections doesn't really give us true representation in Kalamazoo. I came from a town where precincts were elected and you ran in the precinct in which you were going to represent and only did you get votes from those people there. Right now we have a bunch of people on. I would hope that popularity contests are soon going to stop. Thank you. Hi, my name is Jill Brayman. Um, I do, I live in Kalamazoo County, but not within the city. However, my husband works in the area. Um, and I'm calling to say that I don't think the graphic packaging should 
get that tax break. Um, I think that they have shown that they cannot be responsible to the people who live nearby. My husband, every day he came home from work, said, you know, that he smelled that smell. I've, they've had eight violations that have done nothing to fix it. They're not good stewards of the community and they don't deserve that money um, until they can prove that they can, you know, take care of their problems. Um, it's too close to residential areas. The whole thing ought to be moved, let alone expanded. So thank you for your concern. Bye. Mr. Mayor, that was the last call that we had for overall public comment. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Jeff Chamberlain. Uh, first of all, I want to thank everybody who took time to call in tonight. I appreciate that. I know it's not the same as doing it in person. I recognize that as well. So thanks for your time and your thoughts and your effort. Next thing on our agenda tonight is the consent agenda. Uh, City Manager Ritzma, are you set for that? I am, Your Honor. We have seven items this evening. First is the approval of a 63-month contract with Wells Fargo through the Association of Educational Purchasing Agencies, contract number AEP, AIF B 071B for the lease of new copiers and printers in the amount of $180,564.30. Next is the approval of a 63 month copier and printer maintenance cooperative contract with DL Gallivan through the Association of Educational Purchasing Agents. The same contract number is under one in the amount of $101,764.47. Next is the approval of a one-year contract extension with JCI Jones Chemical Incorporated for sodium hypochlorite in the amount of $308,850. Next is the approval of a change order to the current contract with DLZ Michigan Incorporated for the Sun Valley Drive culvert replacement project in the amount of $19,000 for design changes and additional surveys to bring the total PO amount to $126,600. Next is the approval of a two-year contract to purchase powdered activated carbon from SNR Technologies in the amount of $1,428,000. Next is the adoption of a resolution approving the Eighth Amendment to the city's revised brownfield plan. And finally, approval and acceptance of a grant to pay retroactive hazard pay for eligible first responder employees in, the, in an amount not to exceed $1,000 per employee. Thank you, Manager Ritzma. So commissioners, the requested action is to approve items one through seven and authorize the city manager to sign all documents on behalf of the city. Is there a motion? So moved. Motion made by Commissioner Cunningham. Is there a second? Support. I see a hand and I heard a voice. I don't know if those coincided with each other. Uh, I saw a hand from Commissioner Urban. So second by Commissioner Urban. Clerk Borling, will you please call the roll? Commissioner Hess. Yes. Commissioner Pradle. Yes. Commissioner Urban. Commissioner Urban. He's going for it. There we go. Yes. Yes. Vice Mayor Griffin. Yes. Mayor Anderson? Yes. Commissioner Cunningham? Yes. Thank you, commissioners. The items on the consent agenda are approved. We are now down to H, our regular agenda. We have four items on our regular agenda. Uh, City Manager Ritzma. H1 is approval of a $125,000 grant to the Kalamazoo Youth Development Network from an existing allocation of youth development resources which was not used due to COVID-19 service reductions in order to support the Learning Hubs Partnership for Kalamazoo Public School Youth and authorize the city manager to sign all related documents. Uh, thank you, Manager Smith. Is there a report in this item? Yeah, we've got um, Steve Brown, who is the FFE administrator. Um, he has a 
uh, presentation tonight on this unique request. Thank you. Mr. Brown. No, Brown, so I cannot hear you. There you go. You don't look like you're muted, but I can't hear you. Manager Ritzma, is it is Mr. Brown making the entire presentation on this topic? Um, I know Meg. Blinkowitz. How about we we yeah. skip to uh, yeah. Meg here for a moment and give Steve Can some you hear time. Me now, Mr. Mr. There Mayor. we go. Yes, there you go. Yes. Okay, I'm sorry. I hope my audio is okay. Is that all right? Seems yep. like it. Okay. So this evening we have a, a grant to the Kalamazoo Youth Development Network, uh, which is a partner in a number of other youth development activities that the city has undertaken. Uh, the history here is that COVID limited the ability for recreation uh, of the city to really fully implement its parks programs this summer. I'll talk a little bit more about that under the FFE budget uh, later on this evening. Uh, we were simultaneously met with a request from KidNet, Kid Network, Kalamazoo Youth Development Network, to help support an innovative program that they uh, model that they were adopting from other cities um, across the country to help support uh, really those most in need of supportive environments in Kalamazoo Public Schools. And that program is called the Learning Hubs. Um, and the, the overview of it is that on four to five different sites, uh, between about 40 students per site would be provided with uh, additional supports, a positive learning environment, uh, nutrition, and would then be able to complement the digital access for all program, providing free Wi-Fi to a limited number of KPS students that we rolled out this summer. So we see this as a, a further uh, investment and enhancement to the digital access for all program, and really a unique and positive way to use resources that were intended for youth development but couldn't be fully deployed because of COVID in order to help students who um, are really in, in greater need than ever before because of COVID. Uh, so the grant would be directly to support this program. It's my understanding uh, that it's supported by several other local foundations uh, so that it can be sustainable through all three trimesters of this school year. And it would not be anticipated to, to extend beyond the school year barring uh, really, even at this point, what, what seems like an unforeseeable uh, extension of this, this COVID um, emergency. So uh, if Meg Blinkevich is able to jump on with audio and video, uh, Meg is the executive director of Kelmsey's Development Network, a absolutely dauntless champion of youth and the out of school time sector in the city. Uh, I'm proud to say a partner of many of the programs we do um, so welcome, Meg, this evening, and if you want to say a few words, and then if you're available to answer any questions that commissioners may have. Sure. So thank you, Steve. Thank you, Commission, for considering supporting the Community Learning Hub model. This is a model that was created by the City of San Francisco and is also being used in numerous communities around the country. Uh, the City of Madison, Wisconsin, and Cleveland Public Schools are implementing the same type of initiative, Cleveland has raised over a million dollars in the last month to support virtual learning during the day through the out of school time sector. Uh, we have convened over 60 organizations five times since the beginning of August to identify their assets. Uh, community partners, in addition to the out of school time sector, we've asked them, uh, do you have people, do you have programs, or do you have space? Uh, and what asset do you have that you can share in this community learning hub model? And it's all to support uh, Kalamazoo Public School students, especially those who have been identified in the equity cohort by Kalamazoo Public Schools. There are a number of different elements to the community learning hub, as Steve has described. Uh, this grant will support uh, virtual learning 
the space and time and support of adults for virtual learning so that KPS students who have family members who are essential workers uh, and who can't be home necessarily, those students uh, will have somewhere with supporting uh, adults and with access to Wi-Fi to be able to participate in their school's virtual learning. So we very much appreciate your support. We're all about youth being college career community ready and this year being able to step up and create these um, very comprehensive community learning hubs will be a big step forward toward that vision. Thank you, Meg. I appreciate all your work on that so much. Uh, commissioners, are there any questions for staff at this time? Meg, uh, when, would this, yeah. when would this begin? Uh, we hope to have the hubs up and running the second week in October. There's going to be a really fast turnaround. We've got the RFP ready to hit the street. We're going to give folks about a week. Uh, our sector's ready, ready to go. We've been working uh, really, really closely with KPS. Uh, we initially thought the first week in October, but we're thinking that second week in October. Uh, thank you for your work on this. I really appreciate you and all you do in this community. Thank you. Thank you, we appreciate the support. Commissioner Pradel. Sure, um, hey, evening Meg, how are you? Good. Um, so, uh, based on this proposal right now, the proposal lays out to have, uh, what is it, three to four sites and uh, upwards of 160 students that it would be able to support through this program. Um, you know, what happens if demand increases? I mean, are, are, is there any appetite or interest or ability to potentially expand if, if the need seems to exist and the model seems to be working well? Yes. Uh... KPS has stepped up. They are going to be able to serve many hundreds of, of students um, in, in the equity cohort. And yeah, we're hoping that this model, uh, if we're successful early on, which we're, we're confident we will be, that there, you know, if, if there's support for it, that we could build that capacity. I, uh, I also just want to echo and applaud uh, you and your team and uh, other members of the community, like the, the YMCA and mm -hmm. Boys and Girls Club and... Um, yep. You know, big brothers, big sisters, different programs that have really stepped up to fill these gaps in this time. It's it's so critically important for our kids. You know, Parks and Rec as well. Um, you know, who've really just plowed through with uh, all the obstacles going on. Mm -hmm. uh, so thank you so much for for all your efforts on behalf of uh, our area's kids. You're welcome. Other questions, commissioners? Comm uh, Vice Mayor Griffin. Um, yes. One. Uh, the one question I have is: Will this be free? Or will they be yes. associated? Okay. It will be free, yes. Okay, awesome. And I'll just echo the, the sentiments of my fellow commissioners. Thank you for this work. Um, thank you for the work that you've done for our youth. This is very important. Um, oh, I guess I do have another question. Uh, will the sites be spread out uh, throughout the city? Yes. Okay. There are uh, north side, east side, south side, potentially the west side, uh, but in the other neighborhoods, there will be one to two hubs. Okay, okay, yep. thank you. Yep. And that's my last question. Other questions, commissioners? All right, not seeing any other questions. Um, I, I just also want to thank uh, Mr. Brown and the Foundation for Excellence and the capacity to pivot quickly uh, you know, certainly without the great work of the Foundation for Excellence, we unfortunately would probably not be in a position to be discussing this kind of partnership. And obviously this year is going to continue to be a less than perfect year for all young people that are in school. And we're going to be grappling with that uh, uh, and the residual effects of that probably for years to come. But every effort that we can be creative about and fund and work together. It's impressive how many folks are in on this is so important. So thank you, Steve Brown. And uh, thank you to, uh, to you, Meg, and the work that you're doing. Uh, Scott Borley, we please call the roll. There's no motion. We need a motion. Oh, I'm sorry. How about a motion? All right. I'd like, uh, to, I'd like to move that we approve the grant and authorize the city manager to sign all grant related documents. Got it. Is there a second? Support. Support from Commissioner Pradle. All right, now, any more discussion? 
Okay, seeing none, Clerk Borling, please call the roll. Commissioner Pradel. Yes. Commissioner Urban. Yes. Vice Mayor Griffin. Yes. Mayor Anderson. Yes. Commissioner Cunningham. Yes. Commissioner Hess. Yes. Uh, thank you, commissioners, for making a motion and for passing it. Next item is H2, City Manager Gritzma. Adoption of a resolution approving a request from Graphic Packaging International LLC for a PA 198 Industrial Facilities Tax Exemption Certificate for 12 years for real property valued at $191 million. Thank you, Manager Ritzma. Is there a report on this item? Yes, Your Honor, we have uh, several people that want to present on this this evening. I'm going to turn it over to Antonio Mitchell. He is our community investment manager, and he's been one of the city staff working with Graphic on this, on this uh, IFT. Antonio Mitchell, it's yours. All right, thank you. Uh, I would like to thank um, the mayor, vice mayor, uh, city commissioner, and city manager uh, for giving me this opportunity to present um, this opportunity for um, the city of Kalamazoo. We're working with graphic packaging. Um, I want to provide some history and then give um, the city commission um, a layout of what the presentation will be and outline so that we understand uh, the direction we're going into. We're going to try to keep um, this uh, as um, tight and quickly as possible to give you as much information as possible, but in the same um, point of answering as many questions from the community and the commission. Um, so everyone is um, hopefully moving in the right direction on what we're proposing here with this tax abatement. Um, it's real important to understand that this process started five years ago um, with graphic packaging around 2015. Um, in the process of trying to uh, work with the state of Michigan to win um, the $600 million expansion by graphic packaging. Um, I would also like to follow up with thanking past um, mayor, city commissioners, and city staff that worked on this, this project over the, the last five years. Um, this has also been uh, worked on with our um, city of Council Brownfield Authority, the state of Michigan, South Michigan First Staff, Council County Commission, um, Kalamazoo Township Commission, Kalamazoo County, Brownfield Authority, the Michigan Economic Development Corporation, and many other Kalamazoo County and State of Michigan um, organizations to assist with the recruitment and uh, winning of this um, expansion here in Kalamazoo. Um, a number of things have been talked about about communication to the community. It's real important that the community understands that this has been in front of the community for um, pretty much over the last year and a half with public hearings and community information, not only with the city of Kalamazoo, but with um, the city of Kalamazoo's Brownfield Authority, um, city of Kalamazoo Public um, Planning Commission, um, Kalamazoo County Commission, Kalamazoo County Brownfield Authority, and with the state of Michigan, Michigan Economic Development Corporation as well in front of their board. So there's been a lot of uh, public discussion of this project for the last year, year and a half um, and more. And um, it has been a collaborative effort by not only our local staff and community, but also our regional area in the state of Michigan to get to this day of um, moving forth with this incentive. Um, we're gonna have um, four presenters, including myself. I will um, navigate through everyone to, to make sure they, um, present themselves and answers your questions. Um, we hope to hold each presenter, including myself, uh, for this um, introduction portion um, to hopefully 10 minutes um, or less. It may go over depending on the information that needs to be shared. We want to be pretty precise in trying to answer a number of questions that have been brought up by the community and definitely a number of questions that have been brought up by the mayor, vice mayor, and the commissioners um, tonight and before this meeting. Um, I will assist in giving an overview um, of this project. Um, James Baker, Public Service Director uh, with the city, will talk more with a little bit of a presentation on older uh, environmental concerns and the air quality issues. Um, he will be assisted um, uh, by Aaron Wright, representative from Environmental Concern Committee, and then um, Andy Johnson, Government Affairs, 
and sustainability for graphic packaging and his team will um, end um, the presentations with um, a presentation by graphic packaging on pretty much why um, they chose City of Kalamazoo and the importance of this location to their growth and expansion. Additionally, we have um, hopefully online um, some assistance from uh, Consumers Energy um, with hopefully I get Derek's last name, Derek um, Lux. Uh, how is that? And LFG. Nuff. Yeah. Nuff, thank you. Um, he's from Consumer um, Energy and he has a team that's also will be um, available to answer questions by the, the mayor, vice mayor and commissioners um, um, as well. We have um, hopefully Jill Bland will be available as well. She's online to assist with any history with this project. Like I said, the project started in 2015 and we wanna make sure that we provide as much detail as possible to assist with um, your um, decision to move forward. Um, we would like, if possible, uh, for the mayor, vice mayor and commissioners to ask, ask questions um, at the end. But if necessary, if you need to chime in, please um, raise your hand so that I can see it or, or Jeff or, or Jim can see it so we can then recognize and um, get your question answered. So a little history here um, with graphic packaging and how we got to this point. Um, Graphic Passion put an application uh, requesting for a 12 year PA 190 state tax abatement. Uh, this is a state PA 198 tax abatement for 50 cent tax break on real property. Um, so they are paying taxes, they're just getting a 50 cent break. Um, graphic Passion PA 190 is a $1.6 million tax break over 12 years or around $130,000 um, a year uh, per year. In those twelve in that twelve year time period, what does this mean? How does it work? Um, the city's part, um, but that's been a lot of questions. Where you know where does the city come in? Um, the the city came in in the component of the proposal of working uh, with the state and the Office Mission first, uh, putting the package together, the proposal of creating the industrial tax uh, district um, for this location. The graphic packaging location already had two existing tax abatements. Um, what we did um, last year was uh, work with City Commission to combine those two into one major expansion um, district so that Graphic Patch would not only have the opportunity to do this development, but also hopefully room enough to expand um, in the future as well. The district is required for graphic packaging to even apply for a tax abatement. That's uh, real important. So the city had to create that district for graphic packaging be in position to apply for a tax abatement. In that process, um, the other part that's important which we're dealing with tonight is that city is required um, to provide in a vote, which we're looking to do tonight on how many years um, that that tax may be allowed for and what the, those terms would be. Um, you only can go up to a max of um, 12 years. Um, it can be um, flexible. Um, and that gives the commission, you can go the whole 12, you can do a combination, um, and then you can um, put forth um, agreement of uh, responsibility agreement with this um, tax abatement to um, identify items that you think are important that need to be carried out underneath that tax abatement. Um, the district um, in this case was created in December of last year. Um, graphic Packing has already started um, working on their construction. They have already invested around $25 million in cleanup at several sites, including the old Checker Motor site. Um, city of um, city of Kansas BRA site that we also provided for this expansion and growth. Um, in this process of um, cleanup and uh, preparation of these sites, they have removed over 12,000 tons of waste from Checker Motor site, and even 160 um, tons of waste from the city um, BRA site. So that was 12,000 tons of waste that they removed from the Checker Motor site, which was the existing brownfield site, which encompass the city of Kamazoo and Kamazoo Township. Um, this project, um, a lot of people say, what's, what's so important about this project? When graphic 
Graphic Passion expands and completes um, their expansion here in Kalamazoo. That will make uh, Graphic Passion, um, it will have 40% of North America's paperboard packaging will come from the Kalamazoo community, meaning it will be the largest recycling um, paperboard company in North America, right here in Kalamazoo. So 40% of recycling paperboard um, will be coming through Kalamazoo um, on a regular basis, yearly basis. What does that mean? That means 700,000 tons of paperboard made at the Kalamazoo um, mill plant each year will avoid 2.2 billion tons of greenhouse gases annually um, in the community. Um, and when I say community, I mean the United States. That amount represents a forest of 32 million trees. This is a humongous impact, it is a significant impact, um, not only for the country, but also in our process of seeing how important the environment is here in Kalamazoo to have the largest recycling paperboard um, organization here in our backyard, providing recycling services for North America is uh, very important. And that was a humongous attraction component um, for the community and the state of Michigan to be um, part of that process. Um, Graphic also in that process of um, working with, trying to assist with the environment, provides over 3,000 trees a year um, to young students to plant in the community. And this is part of their recycling education program to young people of the importance of recycling and what not only they do, but what they think young people can be doing in the future. I hope that um, we can assist with these presentations and answering hopefully not only the community's questions and concerns, but also the, the mayor, vice mayor, and the commissioner's concerns. So in conclusion, uh, with my portion, um, it is important to know that you as commissioners have flexibility here. Um, um, you can move in a couple different directions. And I wanna make sure you understand that. Um, you can approve it, of course, as is. Um, you can approve with modifications, with years. Um, you can do three, three, six, six, um, or a different combination as um, you wish. Um, you can decline. Um, if you decline, um, pretty much what happens is you're declining on not the tax amendment, but you're declining on the number of years. It would go to the state and they would pretty much send it back to the local community, meaning the city of Kalamazoo, to decide how many years um, you would want to provide for this tax abatement. When, once the city created the industrial district saying it wanted to assist in a tax abatement for graphic packaging, it was then the city's responsibility to create the years on how many um, years you would approve for them to have that tax abatement. And that is your assignment tonight, is to decide how many years and the conditions that you would like um, graphic packaging to have their tax abatement here in the city of Kalamazoo. So, if Mr. Baker is available, there he is. He's going to go first. Um, and then, like I said, we'll be going to Mr. Aaron Wright and then Andy Johnson and the graphic packaging team. Mr. Baker? Yeah, thank you, uh, Mr. Mitchell. Um, uh, you know, thank you, Mayor, City Commissioner, City Manager, uh, for giving me this opportunity to discuss uh, this presentation related to older uh, mitigation efforts, both uh, previous uh, and planned. Uh, I'd like to ask Deputy City Manager Chamberlain at, at this time to um, put up the, the presentation, um, and then I'll, I'll speak through that presentation. Thank you very much. You should see on your screen now, uh, just the first slide. And uh, what I'm gonna talk about tonight uh, really is kind of focusing on uh, these nuisance odors within the community originating at two generally specific locations. That's gonna be the wastewater treatment plant um, and then also the industrial connection that's just south of the city uh, wastewater treatment plant um, that is kind of a junction chamber of uh, pipes and that leads to other pipes. 
Uh, I want to keep in, in mind that these nuisance odors by nature are uh, generated at or near unit processes, um, and they're not part of regulated or monitored stack emissions. So I, I'm not talking about stacks or, or other components that have their own regulated uh, emissions components, uh, com component, uh, components, excuse me. Uh, these odors are often, you know, consequences of the unit process itself uh, and, and many times transient uh, in nature. Uh, next slide, please. So kind of looking back um, and looking forward, uh, we're looking at uh, various odor mitigation strategies to date. Um, these are actions that the city has taken and both in you know, actual work, construction, that, things of that nature, as well as um, planning, studying, design engineering, and construction. Um, kind of going back a little bit in time, um, back in the late 90s, early 2000s, uh, we really saw a decline in um, industrial activity that was just charging to a dedicated industrial line. We call this the uh, Riverview pump station and the industrial line, Riverview line. Uh, a lot of work was uh, done at that point to make some changes, modifications to Riverview pump station. Uh, those changes were really focused on um, the inability for that reduced flow to provide a consistent cleansing velocity of that industrial sewer. So uh, work undertaken at that time was to revamp the Riverview pump station, actually put in smaller pumps, um, reconnect that force main, um, reconnect it to another series of interceptors. And essentially that work kind of leading forward has created the condition that we have now where uh, graphics packaging is the only industrial user on that line. Uh, some further work was done in 2014 uh, to isolate that line out, clean that out, um, and verify some of the slope, pipe gradients, and velocities within that line. Uh, a lot of work started going uh, underway in, in 2015. Uh, we've got this solids handling upgrade project that really focuses uh, at a lot of different areas of the treatment plant. Now, as I said previously, um, we're really talking about those two sources of odors, one being the treatment plant, and there's a lot of things going on within the treatment plant. Uh, so we're getting really specific on a lot of unit processes and areas within the treatment plant. One of those components is the sludge itself, um, the wastewater treatment plant kind of by nature of what it does, creates a, a clean effluent that's regulated and discharged to the river. It also creates what we call a cake or a biosolids. This is a solid residual product that's also regulated and taken to the landfill. Now, the main focus of that 2015 project, which was ultimately designed, permitted, then awarded in 2018, was to reduce the amount of sludge uh, and by volume that was ha that had to be taken out of the plant and transported um, out to the landfill. The uh, design goal of that project really focused on our 20% reduction in solids by volume and also really focused um, air handling and odor control improvements to really eliminate and reduce the wastewater treatment plant itself from being a contributor to these community-wide uh, nuisance odors. We're also focusing a lot of work. We've been doing chemical trials um, and pilot scale testing to um, you know, treat those trucks as they, they leave out of the treatment plant, um, everything from uh, deodorants and, and, and fragrant type uh, chemicals being applied to the sludge to, so that the, the odors are not offensive. Uh, also things such as uh, oxidizers and different things trying to treat the sludge um, in, in piles. The uh, odor control upgrades, um, and, and we'll kind of detail this out in, in further slides, but um, really trying to give uh, an overview of everything. Um, those carbon scrubber units are uh, unit process specific units that are sitting at you know various areas within the treatment plant again trying to control 
odors from the treatment plant, doing it at a kind of point of use location. Um, that project is, as shown, you know, awarded in 2018, and we've been through that construction process all along. Uh, we're also going to talk about EnviroSuite odor monitoring. That's uh, some odor monitoring that we've been doing uh, both kind of in the plant and then in the community. Um, and there's some interactive things with that. Um, and then we're also going to talk about the industrial chamber. That's the chamber I referenced that is kind of this point of connection with other interceptors that come in uh, from the city to the treatment plant. Next slide, please. Talking specifically, specifically about the carbon scrubber units. Um, these units, as I talked about, were part of that bigger um, 2018 project. That was a $15 million project, which included, um, you know, really the goal of reducing the amount of solids that are leaving the treatment plant. Um, that's going to be impactful in terms of if we're generating less solids and removing less solids out of the plant, um, we're kind of tracking less odors out. Uh, the other big component, again, these car carbon scrubber units, about $4.3 million of that work. Um, those units are here. They're installed in footprint. There's additional work that has to happen. There's air plenums that have to go from, you can kind of see in the picture there, the unit. Uh, you can see a, a big fan and a, a discharge. Uh, the big rectangle essentially is the, the carbon scrubber elements. And then what's missing from the photo, it's not installed yet, uh, is a large fiberglass duct or plenum that then goes to that building. That building in the background is our raw sewage pump station. And that's where all the sewage comes and is pumped from that building. So with this unit, we're treating any odors that are generated at that point source and, and treating them. So there's four locations throughout the treatment plant that these units are at. Um, the units are all sized for the uh, area that they're treating. And there's also been a lot of indoor um, air update updates in, in terms of air exchanges and um, the pressurization and different things we're doing within the building um, to facilitate you know, essentially moving all of that air stream out. So the, these items were approved by city commission via contract award in 2018. Um, we've been at it and you know, part of the, the work plan of the construction, getting these units installed. Uh, we're nearing the point of getting these things operational, and we expect these to be operational at the end of this year into early next year. And as soon as those units go online, again, kind of the design intent behind these units are really to focus on eliminating the wastewater treatment plant, the plant proper itself from a source of those um, community-wide nuisance odors uh, that we've been experiencing. Uh, next slide, please. The next area of planned work, you know, really is focusing on that industrial chamber. And, and that's that industrial chamber is a collection point from a discharge that graphics packaging discharges to us. That's currently located on um, the industrial interceptor. And it's, it's a uh, kind of underground front door to the treatment plant, if you will. Um, we've got a lot of large pipes that, you know, kind of originate all throughout the Kalamazoo community and county, and they all have to come to the treatment plant. Uh, these are very big pipes underground. If we had them kind of set outside, uh, they'd almost be tunnels. I mean, they're, the, the pipes are large enough to walk through. Uh, what the Jones and Henry study has indicated for us and, and what um, really has kind of led us to understand is that under different wet well conditions, that's the level of sewage in our pump station, the amount of flow coming through uh, a number of pipes coming into the treatment plant, and you know the amount of discharge from graphics packaging at any given time, uh, also taking into consideration the temperature of the sewage, the temperature of the air, the pressure of the sewage, or the air, the wind direction and speed can create conditions where that chamber acts almost like a chimney in that it can pull odors from the treatment plant back out into the community. It can let out odors from the discharge of graphics packaging clarifier itself. Um, and it kind of all behaves given the constraints of those atmospheric um, 
con, you know, conditions as they, as they change. Uh, that's been some of the challenge and trouble of understanding the, you know, nuisance odors. And, you know, some days it's worse than others. Some days it, we don't experience it. Um, some days it's really bad. Some days it's not so bad. And, and it's kind of a ever-changing process. So our plan for this situation really is threefold. There's three things we're looking at doing. One is to reconnect or change the connection point from that graphics packaging international um, clarifier to a different interceptor. Actually take that over to what we call our municipal interceptor. So we're gonna change the pipe network around. The next component of this project is to put all of those interceptors the municipal interceptors, and there's several of them that kind of come into the plant, is to put those interceptor systems under negative pressure or what we call vacuum. You know, right now they're operating under what we consider atmospheric pressure. Uh, we're gonna kind of reverse that pressure gradient, actually pull a vacuum on all those sewers. Now we're talking about an air vacuum. Uh, this is not um, vacuum for the sewage itself. Once we pull that vacuum, that gives us the ability to not only direct where we're taking the odorous gas, but gives us the ability to provide treatment. Uh, what we propose is a biofilter that would be housed on treatment plant, plant proper uh, property towards the south end of the treatment plant. A photo there kind of illustrates what a typical configuration looks like. Uh, you'll see the mist eliminator, the blower, and the air plenum that's pulling from the mist eliminator. Uh, and what essentially that's illustrating is that would be kind of the pipe that you would see above ground, but that's also would be connected to all the underground pipes uh, that would pull a vacuum on those collective sewers as they enter the wastewater treatment plant. And then all of that air via that fan and blower would be directed to what we call biofilter. Now that biofilter uh, goes below ground as well. There's several layers of media things such as lava rock and uh, root wood chips or root fibers that are ground up. Uh, what that does is that gives us an ability to control the temperature, control the moisture environment, and we can actually uh, provide the right environment for bacteria, a bacteria that's really specifically designed to treat uh, these hydrogen sulfide, reduce hydrogen um, compounds and, and other uh, offensive off gases that are generally created within sewer systems. Um, you know, this is a, a biological approach uh, that has uh, been used in, in wastewater for a number of years. Uh, what's really advanced in most recent years is our ability through materials and our ability through computer control systems to really facilitate an ideal uh, environment for this bacteria to live. Uh, and then that will, you know, essentially give us the ability to treat that. Now, this project is in the design phase, pre-design phases right now. Uh, we have a proposal that we plan to bring to the city commission on October 5th of this year. This will be your next commission meeting uh, where we're proposing action by the city commission to award that design contract to Jones and Henry engineers. Um, our current procurement uh, project plan delivery schedule would put us on pace to uh, construct this all throughout 2021, and then have that operational in kind of early mid-year 2022. Um, so to kind of recap where, what we've talked about is that there's been a lot of work, uh, both in planning and designing. Uh, you'll see the fruits of that labor kind of come online with the first phase, which is focused just within the treatment plant um, in the beginning of 2021. We've got construction that's gonna also occur during 2021. And then the final phases of uh, the uh, treatment systems coming online in 2022. Uh, next slide, please. Continued odor identif uh, identification and tracking. Um, there's been a lot of work to help really gather data and understand that data so that we can be successful in the implementation of our solutions. Um, we launched the EnviroSuite um, platform approximately a year ago. Uh, we first launched that as, as a pilot. We wanted to see what the software would do. We'd want to see how the sensors react and perform. And we want to see how the system uh, would behave and, and you know, whether or not it would work and whether or not the data would be valuable. 
Uh, the data is extremely valuable. Uh, we're now budgeting to enhance the system, employ more sensors, um, and to kind of unlock and utilize that system, you know, in, in, a, in a more advantageous way and to really kind of use more features of that, of that, of that system. Um, you know, this, this EnviroSuite package has been uh, very valuable to us. We've got three sensors within the community. Those sensors measure hydrogen sulfide. We're using hydrogen sulfide as almost a surrogate um, in the, or an indicator chemical of what else could be out there. Um, there are potentially mecaptans um, and other reduced sulfur compounds as well. But by measuring hydrogen sulfide, this is something that we know we can be accurate with in terms of the instrumentation. And then we can um, apply that back to some other compounds as well, given some um, sampling that's been uh, occurring within the wastewater treatment plant specific process areas. Again, those sensors um, are located at Verberg Park. We've got a sensor located in the corner of Riverview in East Michigan, and we have a sensor at Borges Hospital. Uh, the data collected over the last year indicates hydrogen sulfide levels that are consistently above the odor threshold. The odor threshold uh, defined by the EPA is 10 parts per billion, um, but we are seeing that the, um, these levels, that the, the data that we have uh, is below what the EPA would, would classify as acute exposure guideline levels. So at this point, the data that we have uh, corroborates and supports, uh, you know, not only everything that staff has been experiencing and understanding in terms of the, the offensive odors in the community, but it you know, actually gives us data points behind it. Uh, the data is extremely valuable, presents a background to which these plan improvements must be evaluated against. So we've got over a year's worth of data. We're getting ready to bring on kind of the first phase of odor control at the treatment plant. And then we're working through a project to bring on, uh, you know, much more robust kind of system-wide uh, odor control system. You know, we've got data now in hand that can that can measure the success of those proposed projects, um, and we'll be able to evaluate ourselves against what that current background levels are. Certainly, more background uh, data is needed, uh, or, or more data in general is needed. Uh, we're working to implement three additional sensors. We'd like to place those sensors within the community. We'd like to focus that on, on the north side and east side neighborhoods. Uh, we're working right now to procure three more sensors that tie that into uh, our system. Uh, and, you know, this data, once we have it and once we continue to have it, uh, this really opens the door for our ability to turn that over to regulatory agencies uh, we'll have the data on hand. We can uh, provide to universities and medical professionals interested in studying and evaluating community outcomes and health risk exposures. So we've got the data. The data can inform us uh, in terms of success of our projects um, as we implement them. And the data is there to provide for additional study and research. Um, next slide, please. As we talked about really upping uh, the performance of the EnviroSuite software, uh, we haven't been utilizing that software to the utmost of its abilities. Uh, we'll be working through uh, the budget in 2021 uh, to create citizen portals, uh, as well as bring those additional sensors that I talked about. Uh, what a citizen portal does, it allows uh, any member of the community uh, to log on, to identify their own uh, odor complaints. Uh, the system can, can uh, model those odor complaints and provide trajectory for us. And that will continue that work on, you know, ensuring that we're accountable to where the, these odors are, are taking place and where these odors are, are coming. Uh, this will also give the citizens an excellent resource in terms of understanding that their um, complaints are actionable and that we're, we're moving forward with them. Next slide, please. Uh, another component I wanted to, to really highlight and talk about is the community industrial um, kind of community task force. This is the odor task force uh, that we stood up approximately about a year ago to really work collaboratively on odor issues as they arise, 
and provide an engineering approach and solution to it. Uh, the, the Odor Task Force is comprised of uh, the Public Services Department, uh, some of our engineers and uh, technicians within the department, uh, folks from Graphics Packaging International. We have representation from the Environmental Concerns Community. Uh, we've got uh, Kalamazoo County Health Advisory Committee, and we have uh, a citizen member as well. And, and you know, this group is a technical group, uh, really we're focused on um, you know, identifying those odors and, and working collaboratively to solve those, those problems. Uh, so, you know, with that, this concludes the, the portion of my presentation. Uh, at this point, I'll turn it back over to Antonio and, um, uh, and Mr. Mitchell um, can then uh, take us from here. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Baker. Um, next is um, Aaron Wright from the Ramirez Concerns Committee. Um, he's going to continue um, providing some additional information and feedback for uh, the community and uh, Mayor, Commissioner Vice Mayor on this same issue that uh, Mr. Baker um, has spoke upon, but elaborate a little bit more. So, Mr. Wright, please. Thank you. Good evening, uh, commissioners. I appreciate your attention this evening uh, to this issue that the Environmental, Council, uh, Environmental Concerns Committee has been, um, we've had it as a uh, agenda item on, at our meetings for the last couple of years. I just wanted to draw your attention um, to the recommendation that we sent to the city commission um, for specifically for tonight's meeting. Um, the, just briefly the recommendation, um, so, you know, uh, Mr. Baker kind of gave you some of the, the background and there's a little bit of background uh, in the recommendation too. Um, but our recommendation um, just says that significant investment in odor mitigation by both the Kalamazoo Water Reclamation Plant and Graphic Packaging International represent a major step forward in an issue that has been a drag on the quality of life for citizens residing on the north side, the east side, and downtown neighborhoods, as well as Kalamazoo Township and Parchment for many years. The ECC recommends any action the City Commission takes related to the GPI expansion be contingent on the continued efforts to resolve this long-standing problem. So I uh, uh, was invited to the Order task force meetings have been to two. There's a couple more planned. Um, up until just very recently, graphic packaging had not, in my understanding, um, really taken any action towards uh, mitigating any any odor issues. Um, but the uh, meeting we had last, just this past week, um, graphic packaging has um, ordered two. Um, environment two separate environmental studies of the very large open air clarifier um, that they have that that uh, Mr. Baker was talking about there's outflow from that that goes into the you know goes into the city sewer system that's in addition to um, the odor study that they are um, conducting right now under an agreement um, uh, with Eagle um, and my understanding is that is that's being conducted with with uh, if nothing happens uh, based on that that uh, odor study, that there could be possible enforcement action by the state um, based on their multiple um, odor violations over the years. So uh, I've been concerned about this issue. We've talked about this issue quite a bit at the ECC. Um, and just last week is the first time that I've heard of, of, uh, of graphic packaging um, uh, you know, putting some money um, into actually addressing the problem. So I'm, I'm very encouraged um, that things are moving, moving in the right direction. But of course, the devil is in the details. Um, I, I plan to continue to, to show up um, to any meetings uh, re related to this issue. I've lived in Kalamazoo my whole life, and the smell has got to go. Um, uh, there's, there's an air quality um, hearing that'll be conducted by Eagle coming up in October. That's not really related to the to the nuisance odor issue. And I, I don't say nuisance odor as in it just bothers me. The the nuisance odor is the uh the there's a state rule, Eagle State Rule 901 related to nuisance odors. That's the name of the rule. And that's the where the violations have, have piled up for graphic packaging over the years. Um, 
There's also two more um, older task force meetings. And uh, like I said, we'll, we'll continue to talk about this uh, at the ECC until the, the issue was resolved. Um, but I'm very encouraged um, at uh, all, the, all the money and time and effort that both the city and um, graphic packaging appear to be um, putting into this, uh, th this issue. Anything else? No, I'll do it. All right. Thank you, Mr. Wright. Appreciate it. Um, and now we're going to move to um, our last um, portion of the presentation um, with uh, Mr. Andy Johnson, the Government Affairs and Sustainability um, Representative. And he has a team that he'll call on um, to answer additional questions um, that may be part of his presentation. So, Mr. Johnson, it is your turn. Thank you. Can you hear me all? Yep, can hear you. Okay, great. Um, I'd just uh, like to say thanks to <coughs> the mayor, vice mayor, uh, commissioners, um, city manager, um, for the opportunity to speak. Um, what we're going to do uh, here is uh, um, we're going to have myself, uh, Rich Townley, um, who's on video right now. Um, uh, he's going to cover off on a few items. I'm just going to give some overview remarks and then um, uh, turn it over to him. We do have... <coughs> um, other uh, folks um, available uh, from our team, we'll introduce them as, as necessary. And uh, we also have some folks in uh, consumers energy. Uh, <clears throat> well, after the the August public hearing, um, we thought we needed to take a step back and, and really listen. Um, we participated in several listening sessions and um, <clears throat> with community representatives better understand our perspective, the community's perspective. Um, uh, from those sessions, we heard graphic packaging is a valued employer, uh, and there's some excitement around the um, expansion. Um, however, uh, we are not viewed as a community partner. Uh, we aspire to be. And we heard feedback about graphic packaging was leading some people to question our commitment to the community with respect to the order concerns. And I think we heard, heard some of that here today, too, on the, on the comments. Um, we also identified there's some misperceptions. Uh, that uh, we would request your consideration to understand and also understand the steps we have been taking and um, are taking to, to address um, odor. It's important to, uh, to us at Graphic that we're open and transparent and um, with all of you and with the community and uh, we'll continue to take actions uh, to address odor concerns as, we, uh, as the data is generated to help uh, guide our decisions and actions. Um, I think the most important thing for us right now is um, that um, that we, we really look at the uh, opportunity here to um, uh, have a new dialogue and work with the city around communicating what we are doing and the results generating. Um, I know it's going to be a lot of questions and I welcome them. Um, and so as our team, as we have some people on here tonight to, to, to answer and respond. Um, we'll do our best um, uh, ability to answer those questions, uh, and we'd ask for your patience and consideration. Maybe some questions we just don't have the answer to, or there may be some follow-up that we need to do. Um, we hope we can answer the questions for you to make your decision tonight. I want to highlight a few steps we, we have been taking um, in regards to the order. Um, we're going to continue to participate in the order task force, um, and um, we'll provide quarterly reports or report out as frequently as uh, you folks would like in regards to being able to form what we're doing and the progress we're making. Um, we're gonna work with the city and the Kalamazoo water treatment plant on additional steps that can be taken to enhance quality of life. And we will work on that as we understand the data that's coming forward. Um, we are gonna continue working on the odor investigation plan which we included in the, uh, the, the packet for this meeting. Uh, that was approved by Eagle and um, we'll take the appropriate actions um, that result of that report. Um, it's due, um, the report is due on uh, November 8th. And uh, so we're going through the process right now of understanding um, what has been collected for data and, and what, what it means and then plotting that out and understanding it. Um, we will come back to this, uh, this group um, and uh, also to the order task force with um, our action plan as it results from that report. Uh, we'll provide uh, environmental data to EGLE as appropriate and as necessary to help identify and understand um, odor complaints. Uh, and um, and we, um, we've just 
implemented those. Um, Ten of them have been installed, uh, and they've been uh, in place for a little over a week. Um, we have ordered another six um, to get, get more coverage across, and Rich Tony will talk more about that. Um, we currently spend and have been spending $1.2 million per year uh, and uh, to, uh, to add chemical treatments to the waste product that we are um, sending to the um, waste treatment facility. So we do happen to do some work. Um, there's also some other things that we shall talk about on, on the work that we've been doing. Um, but it's all about results, right? And so we're going to investigate and understand how that um, investment um, each year on um, the chemical treatments um, is in light with, of the uh, order investigation plan and also the expansion activities. Um, in our expansion plan, we have $4 million for odor control technology to to help um, with our effluent and uh, minimize total effluent and also reduce surges to the city. Um, and uh, we, we, we looked at that to help reduce and mitigate order, um, potential order issues. Um, we would expect to realize the full benefits of that program once the machine is fully up and running, and that will be the first quarter of 2022. Um, we agree with the JNH study that found that the city's legacy oversized infrastructure needs to be addressed, and I think James did a great job going through that. Um, we look forward to seeing uh, that um, uh, be turned on, come on commercial, and, uh, and be analyzed as we go forward to see how there's changes being made in the community. Um, we, um, we, we're going to continue to participate with the schools uh, like we do every year. Uh, we, we have a program called Trees in the Cartons, Cartons in the Trees. It's an educational program uh, that we uh, educate children on where paperboard packaging comes from, the life cycle of paperboard packaging, the importance of recycling, which is going to be really critical, um, as Antonio has mentioned, um, uh, especially with the size and presence that the Kalamazoo community will have around recycling. Um, we donated 3,000 trees last year, and we've done that for, for, for many years. And, uh, and uh, it's, it's always a, a very well-received program by the kids and the teachers in the school. Um, we're going to uh, collaborate with the city on a communications plan. Uh, Jeff, uh, uh, Chamberlain, and I have been discussing uh, how we would do something like that. And uh, we don't have all the uh, plans in place right now, but we think it's important uh, to be able to communicate uh, and make sure people understand what is being done, what has been done, and then the results um, of, of our actions. Um, there were several questions we received uh, in the last few weeks regarding what does our Kalamazoo complex do? Um, and uh, we included in the packet um, just a, a simple diagram around that, but essentially what it does is uh, it takes um, recycled fiber, uh, and we break it down uh, and make it into recycled paperboard that gets shipped across the nation. Um, we have a carton manufacturing plant right across the street from our mill, and a lot of that paperboard goes there, and that's a closed loose loop system, so any paperboard that becomes waste goes back to the mill. Um, we make uh, 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 paperboard cartons out of that paperboard. It uh, is for food, uh, for tissue, for N95 masks, um, essential products. So we um, we take our, our role and responsibility very seriously and, and our commitments to our customers and making sure that we are making products that they need to be able to distribute their products to the consumers. Um, Antonio mentioned that the expansions, uh, when it's complete, 40% of the um, recycled paper board will be, um, will, will start from the uh, Kalamazoo community. And I think that's a very um, exciting thing when it comes to climate change. Um, and um, um, the uh, avoided emissions by recycling that paper uh, is uh, not only is it uh, representing uh, 32 million trees, but that's about 2.6 million uh, U.S. forest acres. So essentially what we've got here is a, a virtual forest that, that's being managed with this recycling. So, um, and we're going to increase the amount of recycling that we have. There, just a couple of things around on the footprint. We've been asked some questions about what does the carbon footprint look like or environmental profile? of this project and um, the, the expansion um, supports our overall sustainability um, uh, program and social responsibility program that we have a graphic. Um, we started and formalized that program back in 2008 and for uh, the first um, first phase of that program, we reduced our greenhouse gases as a company by 30%. Um, we set another uh, sustainability vision in 2025 to reduce um, greenhouse gases by another 15%. 
Um, this project here will help us reduce our greenhouse gas emissions as a company by 4%. So, so we have 4% of that 15% in this project here as we, as we go forward. So it's a very important uh, program for us. Um, the, um, the amount of um, greenhouse gas reduction will be about 75,000 tons. And that's about 92,000 acres of, of U.S. forest land. So, so it's a big, uh, it's a sizable um, um, you know, program for us on a macro scale um, in uh, being able to uh, to provide and, you know, it's support to reduce the impacts of climate change. And um, and you know a lot of that's going to happen with our ability to be able to take inefficient mills uh, and paper machines and other uh, two other locations and consolidate them into uh, the Kalamazoo facility. Um, with that, I'm going to uh, um, just uh, take a break here and give Rich a chance to talk about the, the order mitigation work and that we've been doing along with the uh, task force and in other activities. So, Rich. Okay, thank you. Um, I want to first cover uh, our involvement with the odor task force, as uh, has been mentioned earlier. Uh, GPI was asked to join with the city of Kalamazoo, Kalamazoo Water Reclamation Plant, initially to establish an odor task force uh, in order to improve communication, coordination, and um, the overall impact of our efforts that both organizations were taking independently before that. Um, I represented GPI at the very first of these discussions and the initiation of the task force, and I've been present at each of the meetings of the odor task force. Uh, since it began. Um, I learned at the first order task force meeting that, you know, we could certainly improve the communication uh, of what we were working on. Um, it was also through our participation, GPI's participation, the order task force that uh, the EnviroSuite product was introduced to us. Um, after seeing the system demonstrated at uh, the very same uh, meeting that was referred to earlier, um, you know, I was very impressed with the ability of the system uh, to approximate the location and source of an odor. Uh, at that time, GPI began working with the supplier to try to develop an appropriate pro proposal, um, get to the point of being able to get a proposal that was, you know, right for us and designed for us. Um, COVID certainly did impact the ability to get work through that process. Uh, to get to an order and then significantly delayed the delivery of the equipment. Um, GPI did ultimately order a system with 10 hydrogen sulfide sensors. Uh, that system was delivered to GPI in the afternoon of September the 8th, uh, so just a couple of weeks ago, um, two weeks ago tomorrow. Uh, within 48 hours of receiving uh, that system, we had it up and running and online. Um, the data collection was, as we had seen at the City of Kalamazoo's demonstration, uh, the data collection and the display and the analysis certainly Im impressive. Um, Going to be used to, uh, you know, guide and direct, much as was mentioned earlier, uh, provide us with the data, uh, very much the same as was mentioned by the by Director Baker. It's going to provide us with the data to help define and successfully identify and then implement solutions, and then also to measure the impact of those efforts that we take so that we can see the before and after and, and quantify that, it, that there has been an improvement. Um, in early review of that data, again, it's still very early days. It, it, it's, it's just been up uh, for about 13 days, 12 days right now. Um, we did start to notice that there were times, depending upon conditions, that there were gaps. And so, as uh, Mr. Johnson mentioned, we immediately uh, took action, reached out to uh, the vendor, uh, Virus Suite, and we are uh, working towards buying an additional six sensors, uh, trying to, you know, identify the delivery schedule. Uh, right now, we, you know, we, we, we can only say that once they're, we're getting them as, here as quickly as we possibly can, as quickly as the vendor will provide them. Uh, once we receive them, uh, we'll deploy the additional sensors again, and we'll do it within days, just like we did when we received the initial 10. Uh, we'll certainly update the odor task force and the personnel over at Kalamazoo Water Reclamation uh, that we've got the additional sensors online and deployed. Um, and as we continue to develop and assess and analyze the data, 
from our current 10 and soon to be 16 sensors. Uh, we'll be continuing to work with the Odor Task Force and with the personnel at the KWRP plant to um, uh, help us to understand it and to uh, share it with, K with the City of Kalamazoo and with KWRP and with the Odor Task Force and, uh, you know, help us to all guide these efforts uh, and direct them to be able to implement solutions in addition to the uh, other actions that have already been discussed and referred to. So that was my uh, update that I wanted to give on our involvement with the other task force and our early experience uh, with and uh, action related to the EnviroSuite product. Thank you very much to the Odor Task Force for in the city for um, our involvement in that in order to be able to be even exposed to that product and certainly impressed with its capacity and capabilities. Thanks, Rich. I just have just uh, one, a uh, couple more remark remarks to close it out. Um, uh, there's been some concerns and discussions around protection of public health. Um, right now, um, we are um, under and uh, conducting an order investigation with regard to an odor nuisance claim, um, and um, that was filed in 2019. Um, we're not aware of any, um, or do we believe that GPI op operations create public health nuisance, and we're not under any um, uh, notice from Eagle at this at uh, this time. Um, we would also uh, really like to thank the the you know the commissioners. This has been a long journey. Um, we've met with city, the county, the township, uh, in the state. And as Antonio mentioned, it's been a, a multi-year program and we appreciate uh, the consideration you've given us up to this point um, and um, um, look forward to answering any questions you guys may have. All right, thank you, um, Mr. Johnson. We appreciate Graphic Packaging assisting with this process. Um, I'm gonna turn this back over to uh, Mayor Anderson to assist uh, with um, identifying hands um, so we can go through the questions. And then, like I said, we have enough, um, hopefully people here with expertise that we can answer all of your questions or hopefully a good number of your questions um, to your satisfaction. Uh, Mayor Anderson. Uh, thank you, Antonio Mitchell, first for helping put this very, very comprehensive uh, response together and bringing this team together. I appreciate that a great deal. I think it's very helpful. I'm not sure if we met our 10 minute limit uh, that you mentioned at the beginning, but I, I will I will waive any concern about that because I, I think it's important we have these kind of discussions. So that said, now there's a time for questions. I see that Commissioner Pradle, uh, you had a question to get started with and we can just start rolling here. So Commissioner Pradle. Sure. Um, I just have a, a number of questions and, and a number of these came from uh, different constituents and, and citizens of the city. Um, and I uh, in the presentation, you spoke a little bit about the uh, Brownfield um, project at the old Checker Motor site. Um, and uh, I think uh, Ant um, uh, Antonio, you had mentioned um, that part of that was uh, 12,000 tons of waste were removed. Um, would you mind just talking a little bit more about that Brownfield remediation? And you know, when you talk about that 12,000 uh, tons of waste, is that debris from the original site or is that you know contaminated, um, uh, is that contamination that's removed as 12,000 tons? What, what, what does that brownfield project look like and, and the remediation of that site? Okay, um, Mr. Miller, you wanna take that baton? Oh, you have to mute. Uh oh, still on mute. I think sometimes having earbuds right. in. Okay, there we go. There you go. There you go. There you go. There you go. Well, yeah, I'm Rusty Miller, graphic packaging, and I was uh, responsible for the uh, kind of our debris removal uh, from our different uh, sites that we bought. But specifically for uh, Checker, we, we removed uh, 12,500 tons of uh, hazardous materials. Uh, most, most of that was asbestos-containing materials. When they uh, knocked down the buildings, uh, they had asbestos in the in the roofing materials that got mixed, all mixed in with the rubble and debris. So we had uh, you know, 12,500 tons of uh, asbestos containing, primarily asbestos containing materials we had to dispose of off the checker site. We had uh, uh, 31 tons of just general uh, you know, C and D construction you know, demolition, demolition debris. 
uh, we were able to recycle uh, five and a half uh, ton or five fifty five hundred tons of uh, recycled metal, and then we recycled uh, forty thousand tons of uh, concrete. So all told, it was almost ninety thousand tons of uh, debris that we either you know, removed or recycled from the uh, checker site. Uh, if I could just add on that, um, um, the, those properties in that remediation, uh, it was valued about $25 million. And um, with the approvals we got on the brownfield, um, 13 million will, I'm sorry, 12 million will be um, recovered over a 30 year period. Uh, and the other 13 million is uh, what graphic has, has contributed to the process of removing that. Um, Rusty mentioned is checker. Uh, that's where the where we have some construction, but we also purchase other field facilities around the area there that are not being constructed on right now. Yeah, yeah thank you, gentlemen. Um, can you speak to as well? So you mentioned that, uh, like, yeah, I think it was like forty four percent of North America's um, recycled um, paperboard is going to come from this facility. But in terms of like making the strategic decision to expand here in Kalamazoo. Was there any decision making about being a supplier to a major uh, company or whatnot and, and, and proximity to try to save on transportation emissions and those sort of things? Was that at all part of the decision making? Um, it certainly is. And we have in the Kalamazoo region, the network there, there is a lot of um, manufacturing plants that utilize uh, customers that utilize our, our materials. So, so our network will ship uh, to our converting plants, which then um, kind of connects up with our, our customers. And it's around uh, really trying to get the um, materials to very efficient carbon plants, um, and uh, but close to uh, to uh, some of our customers. And so, so there's a couple of phases in it, right? You got to make the board, and that goes to a converting plant. Then that carton then ships to a customer. So you got to kind of um, utilize both of those. Um, there is a, uh, a very um, robust supply of recycled materials, uh, but when we increase more recycled materials, we're going to be pulling more out of the market uh, in the region there. So um, that was uh, one factor we, we, we took into account, but um, as we looked at it, we thought we would have uh, an ample supply of, of recycled fiber. I think Jill Blank would like to. Uh, can, can I add to that? So as part of this project, and Chris, this kind of goes back to where they're shipping product to um, out of that facility. As part of the development of this project, as we've gone through this, we've had multiple conversations with um, Michigan Department of Transportation about that US 131 business loop interchange. And it really was a direct result of how do we get the trucks associated with this project out of the neighborhood so it's not going down into downtown Kalamazoo, we're using the business loop and going out and around. So for those going to our neighbors to the east, they can go out to the highway and down and around on 94, keeping them out of the neighborhood. Um, so again, that local emissions and, and those types of things. It went so far as uh, Representative Holdley was instrumental in helping us um, with an appropriation to help do the engineering for that highway interchange, the redesign. Unfortunately, COVID kind of took the money away, but um, that is something that we continue to have dialogue with MDOT on. So I think this was a good place to interject that. That's another element. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so um, another question I heard during the presentation, you know, uh, Director Baker, you mentioned uh, that you guys are expanding uh, data collection both to the north side and the east side, but also uh, our friends from um, GPI, you guys mentioned that you guys are also expanding uh, monitoring as well. Uh, does that provide you guys with the ability from a, an accountability perspective to kind of compare notes and, you know, compare what you're finding and share data with each other? I mean, uh, yeah, yes, uh, it, it, it obviously our sensors are all deployed on our property. Uh, but it does, uh, again, the reason to move so quickly to add another six sensors was because in the early review of the data, uh, we could see some gaps. And in fact, I could see us at an odor task force meeting talking with the other odor task force members, trying to present and explain some data and having some obvious 
openings that we would, you know, would rather have filled. So the thing that made sense to do was to uh, take that very, very early data collection and identify where we had gaps and do what we could do immediately as quickly as possible, close those gaps. It'll facilitate and make more useful that sharing of information and collaboration with the Odor Task Force and with KWRP. Absolutely, it's exactly the point. All right, thank you. Um, the other thing, question I had as well is, and just kind of doing some research on um, preparation for tonight, uh, tonight's meeting, somewhere along the line, I remember hearing or seeing somewhere that um, that the way that the plant, the new plant will be fueled or, you know, the way that uh, the energy um, consumption will be used will be through natural gas. Um, is, is that the case? And is that any different from the way the current plant is, is functioning? It, it is true that the fuel that we're going to be used to power the plant and to power the boilers is 100% uh, completely natural gas. Yes, uh, there has been historically um, a opportunity, the ability to use fuel oil, but uh, that's be, that's been re actually been physically removed. Okay. Yeah. So we'll we'll no longer uh, burn fuel oil. So that the, yeah, that one of the big benefits of that is a, a huge you know, reduction in uh, particulate emissions. Is that part of your 2008 initiative to cut down uh, emissions as well as the, the kind of a, a systematic approach to switching to natural gas as a fuel source? Yeah, yeah. I would comment. I, I think across our footprint, uh, that's it's been the direction we've been heading. Yeah. yeah, we utilize in our virgin mills, we utilize biomass. Uh, that's the, um, the bark and branches. Uh, from the trees uh, so everything from the stump up gets used in the virgin mills and we have four virgin mills that's the beginning of the process for recycled fiber right and so um and we've seen a, a move uh, towards natural gas across our system um over the last um, several years i know um you know a lot of eyes and ears are paying attention to the city commission tonight on this um but i was just kind of curious if you can explain some of the other just jurisdictions or bodies that have been a part of this 600 million dollar process uh, from start to finish as well um it's, so the um uh, along with the city we've met with the uh, county brownfield uh township brownfield um medc michigan economic development um and um we work with them in southwest michigan first as the as the um uh, the package is put together um, over the last few years. Um, so, so those are the groups we have worked with. We work with the MDOT, uh, as Jill has mentioned. I know Jill just jumped back on, so I'm gonna let her uh, talk a little bit about that. Um, and the um, transportation um, folks at the city and you know, trying to work through, um, um, really looking at how, how can we move traffic differently for the trucks. So Jill, do you have any more comments on that? I was just gonna add Kalamazoo Charter Township, KVCC, WMU, um, some of the workforce development organizations, the K through 12 system, they've all been in various ways part of the discussions with this as we put forward a workforce strategy and, you know, to, to make sure we can fulfill um, the workforce. Again, when you have an older facility like this, you have to look at um, the retirement rate. And as we're seeing our population um, getting older, that's something that obviously we want to make sure we've got that pipeline coming in um, at the younger age. And a facility, the paper industry as a whole is generally a multi-generational industry, but as we see changes occurring in the, in the workforce, we've got to make sure that we had a plan in place from a community perspective to be able to work with them, so. Do you agree on, we, um, we, we sat down with uh, Jill and her team, um, and 40% of our employees are retirement eligible. And so we're, we're gonna go through a transition here over the next few years of folks, um, uh, you know, going to the next chapter of retirement and uh, folks coming in. And um, so we look at, you know, any opportunity uh, for uh, creating, um, really developing our talent pipeline uh, to bring in uh, replacement employees. I mean, that's gonna be really critical as we go forward uh, in the facility. Jill, could you also talk about Western's involvement in, in that workforce development component? Well, sure, sure. So Western Michigan University, I think they uh, have one of maybe only four um, paper programs in the nation um, in terms of paper science engineering. And I'll look at Rusty and, and Andy, they probably can add to this. But um, there's a longstanding partnership with the university to 
um, utilize their students for internships and then hopefully keep them in the, the community um, and grow them. So um, I think uh, it's, it's kind of a neat note to make that the CEO of Graphic Packaging started at Western Michigan University, graduated from there and started um, working here in the community. And so um, his, his career is really attributable to Kalamazoo and the mill that's here in the community. And as he kind of went up through the ranks, but there's a very strong partnership with the university. Um, and, and it's also in, I think the integrated supply chain program and some of the other programs, but certainly in that paper science program, it's very strong. Sure. Just to pull on that, folks, we, um, um, we have contributed uh, to the university. Um, they use one of our old pulpers for a very important test on testing for repulpability and recyclability of materials. Um, and um, and um, they run that test for a lot of um, consumer brands for they, so that they can quantify uh, the recyclability of those products, and so which is really important from a recyclability standpoint. I was wondering, I, um, I also remember, uh, I can't remember, I think it was one of our small groups, I think it might have been uh, Director Baker or, or DCM Chamberlain, but had mentioned that uh, there was a report that had come out, the report that was mentioned a number of times that's come out since our last city commission meeting. And I just wonder, you know, did the, did the results of the report did it validate, you know, the concerns of the citizens in terms of, you know, their observations and experiences with um, um, the quality of life odors in, in the neighborhood? I should say neighborhoods. That, uh, I'm thinking that's, is that you, Baker? Can you assist with that question? Yeah, so I think, um, you know, the, to restate the question, there's been, you know, many reports that have come out. Um, many of those reports have been focused on, on process areas. Um, there's, you know, um, we do have data collection, uh, that's the EnviroSuite software itself, which is, you know, provided, uh, you know, a year's worth of background uh, data collection in those three areas that I referenced, which would be uh, Verberg Park, Borges Hospital, and the intersection of East Michigan and um, Riverview. That data, uh, again, corroborates, you know, what we're hearing from the citizens, that there's, there's a nuisance odor quality of life odor. This is an odor that's above the odor threshold uh, that is permeated through the community um, and, you know, is rather sustained um, and, you know, it's, it's rather um, persistent. And, you know, utilizing that data as a resource as we, you know, guide future success of future projects and using that data as a resource, uh, you know, for future investigation and, and future research in the matter um, it's there. And of course, those are three data points. Um, and, and we'd like uh, more data points, you know, here in the future, you know, of which we're going to add three locations uh, with the goal of making that into the north side and east side neighborhoods. Um, the other question I have for you guys as well is, so, you know, you, you mentioned Director Baker about some pretty significant uh, cap capital improvements and utility upgrades. Uh, one is a $4.2 million upgrade that uh, was appropriated in 2018 that hasn't even been fully realized and won't be realized probably till the end of this year, early 2021, and that's that's phase one. Um, and then you also discussed, you know, another uh, four million dollar enhancement that you know would be realized in 2022. And so, you know, I think you know from a public's perspective, you know, see they see a you know 21 million dollar tax break, uh, you know, but then they see that the city is investing eight million dollars on this infrastructure uh, that's going to pre predominantly be used by one major uh, industrial entity. Um, can you explain how that works a little bit in, in terms of, you know, if, if, if that funding that we're investing is recouped through usage and whatnot as well? Yeah, I think that's a the good question. And, and thank you, Commissioner, for asking. And it kind of really starts to get down into the details of the project justifications. Um, and of course, these are two projects. The justification for each project is slightly different. So focusing on the first project, the carbon scrubber units, uh, that was appropriated in 2018. Construction has been ongoing since then, and we plan to have those operational by end of this year, early part of next year. Um, that Those units are focused at the wastewater treatment plant. The wastewater treatment plant is what we call a common all asset that provides waste treatment for uh, many communities throughout the entire Kalamazoo County, communities stretching into Van Buren County, community stretching into 
Barry County. So there's uh, a community population equivalent connected to the wastewater treatment plant, uh, upwards of 220,000 people that are, you know, contributing to or a component of that work. Uh, in, in a sense, it's it's the city's treatment plant, um, but it also serves our, our greater community, the regional Kalamazoo, um, our, our city to the south, the townships that surround us, and all these other communities. So it's really focused on, on the wastewater treatment plant as a component or contributor for uh, that community-wide nuisance odor. Um, shifting gears into the kind of that, that second project, the project that uh, we're talking about in preliminary design right now, the design contract coming to the city commission on October 5th, the construction for that project uh, occurring throughout 2021, and then us bringing that project online being operational in 2022. Um, there's three major components of that project. That is to um, connect the industrial discharge from graphics packaging right now to another pipe, utilizing um, a 54 inch pipe as uh, one of our primary um, air ducts within that interceptor system. And then putting a vacuum or negative pressure on all the interceptors as they kind of come into the treatment plant. Now those interceptors um, have large regional components in terms of contributing flow and, and co contributing geographical areas. Uh, the 78 inch interceptor uh, which is arguably the largest of the interceptors, um, really flows every regional contributory sewer um, that kind of flows along the Kalamazoo River um, to include the Southwest and Portage interceptors as well. But a lot of flow comes through that, a lot of connected community comes through that. And that chimney effect that I talked about where um, depending on wet well levels, depending on air temps and pressure, wind speed, velocity, um, we can actually induce a situation where through that connection that is um, it's a city owned connection, but it's on graphics packaging property right now, uh, we can actually start pulling odors from that city well well. So these projects are funded by the city and essentially they're responsibility of the city um, and speak to the common all asset that is the wastewater treatment plant. Um, and those common all assets as they are that interceptor network that provides our opportunity to reach out and connect to other regional communities and serve those greater populations. So um, there's large community benefits. There's benefits related to graphics packaging, um, to nuisance and, um, you know, orders that are generated, fugitive orders that are generated in, in that area. Um, but this, this really is also extremely focused on city infrastructure and kind of that connected underground tunnel system, if you almost think of it that way, um, at the front door, the underground front door to the wastewater treatment plant. And I would imagine, you know, as a company as well, do they pay for their, their water and sewer like other, uh, you know, entities as well? Correct. Uh, not to bore everybody with a detailed explanation of, of wastewater rates and how we arrive at them. In short, wastewater rates are attributed to customer class based on loading allocation. So when we look at the wastewater treatment plant, we'll have what we call in-city customers, out-city customers, industrial customers. Each industrial customer is broken down into the load that they, you know, kind of impart upon the treatment plant. Think of it like a pie. We divvy up everybody a piece of the pie, and then the cost is then divvied up in the same manner. That being said, uh, customers such as Graphics Packaging International, uh, they use a big piece of that pie. Uh, their rate is uh, apportioned or appropriated in the manner in accordance with the loading. We always do a loading um, and plant allocation study in accordance with our, our rates and our customers such as Graphics or our other industrial, large industrial customers do pay large portions of that pie. Now, the in-city and out-city portions of the pie are also big, but those pieces of pie are, are split up amongst, for the case of the city, 75,000 residents. Um, in the case of the out-county areas, uh, another big portion of, of residential users. So um, that's, you know, in a sense, how we um, break up loading allocations and cost allocations. 
Um, that's actually EPA method that was required during the Clean Water Act in 1972. And we're actually required to allocate costs in that manner, um, given our size as a treatment plant and given our um, industrial pollution prevention program and the fact that we serve large industrial customers. So the cliff note version, I mean, basically uh, as an entity, they would pay their fair share in terms of water and sewer. Correct, they pay their fair share of the, the current capital years program allocated costs by user class. Okay. Um, and last question here and I'll, I'll end here. Uh, I appreciate everybody's time for me to ask these questions. Um, you know, I grew up as kind of a pretty simple kid over on the Northeast side of Kalamazoo. So I'm pretty much in the epicenter of growing up in the stink, if you will, um, uh, in the neighborhood right off of Riverview, Mount Olivet area. And, you know, I think, you know, for me, I remember I, I read through your letter from uh, September 17th and you said, uh, you know, after the August meeting, you wanted to take a step back and listen. You participate in several listening sessions to better understand the community perspective. Next quote, you say, however, we are, are not viewed as a community partner that we aspire to be, end quote. You know, for the people who I grew up next to, you know, who may be watching this, watch me and how I make my decisions, you know, what, what can you do to just assure me as a person who's going to vote on this tonight, but also the greater community that you will stick with this, um, this odor issue and, you know, making this right so that we can make a higher quality of living for the people in this community and so we can be a true uh, dynamic partnership between community and citizens and the business community here in Kalamazoo. I think, um, as, as I mentioned earlier, uh, you know, we're going to continue working with the uh, Order Task Force, uh, and we're going to report out uh, to you folks as frequently as necessary to, so you understand what we're learning from the data and what actions we're taking to address uh, the things that we're learning, right? And so, um, and that is, uh, you know, at your discretion, uh, as frequently as you uh, folks want us to report out, we will do that. Um, we're certainly going to do it through the Order Task Force and be very active. Um, we look at, um, at James and his team's partners in this process. Uh, we're connected literally together, right, uh, through the sewer system. So, so we we uh, we have to work together. And so, um, that's what we're going to do. Uh, we the Eagle um, um, Order Investigation Plan, or the Order of Michigan Eagle asked for, will be public, and you'll see uh, the data and what uh, this third party has been doing as they've gone around uh, the community and our facility and have characterized the orders um, that they uh, are coming across. They're also measuring the level of intensity. So, so that, that information will be public and certainly we will review that with, the, with this group here uh, and, and put our, um, um, you know, our action plan against whatever we learn. So that's, that's I mean, we, we get the community wants progress. Um, you know, part of, part of what you do is uh, you get a lot of engineers on this call, by the way, and, and we need data to understand um, where there's, problematic areas that we have to address. And, and that's what we're doing now. Thank you everybody for your time. And thank you, Mr. Mayor. Questions from other commissioners. Uh, Commissioner Hess. Um, I wanna say that I think this request um, is because of a, a pushback by the community uh, back in August. And, and I appreciate that because we have issues, not only issues of environment, but of race and racial justice. We have issues of communication between city and business. Um, we uh, have seen tonight the willingness of people to gather together around issues of great importance to this community. Um, and that said, I appreciate everyone's willingness to be here negotiating and talking and communicating in good faith. Uh, that said, uh, Aaron, uh, because I sit on ECC and you're as a chair, and I want to say uh, I respect your leadership and your voice and uh, the way that you're you're going about the ECC business. Um, can you talk a little bit about uh, the climate action plan and uh, how the climate action plan coming to the city might uh, might have an effect on some of the things that we're talking about here tonight? And anybody else can join in too. But Aaron, I, I, I know that the ECC is putting one together. Uh, yeah, so the ECC is eager um, to see a, a draft climate action plan. Now the actual, 
you know, putting a plan together really is more on city staff to, to bring all the, uh, you know, relevant partners together. Um, we, uh, we just had a kind of a subcommittee meeting for um, uh, planning data collection and, and goal setting um, this past week. Um, that, that group will meet again pretty soon. Um, uh, in terms of graphic packaging's expansion, um, I, I would imagine that, uh, um, you know, their carbon footprint would be uh, definitely be part of any uh, data collection on the, on the part of the city. Um, we, there are multiple people that are at work right now um, a, a, as we meet kind of working on getting a, a, a draft together of, of a climate action plan. So it, it the ECC is uh, eager to get that going. The, you know, it's been almost a year since the um, uh, city commission passed the climate action, uh, climate, um, climate crisis resolution. Um, but getting the details of that plan together, there's, you know, there's been some backup from, um, you know, uh, COVID-19 kind of slowing things down. Um, but um, myself and members of the ECC continue to um, uh, push to get uh, at least a draft plan in place. Once the once there's a draft plan together, then that plan would come uh, to the East in front of the ECC um, so that we can ask questions and kind of vet the plan. Um, so I'm, I'm eager to see uh, a, a draft by the, by the end of the year. Thank Again, you. it's it's a it's a complicated it's a complicated issue of where you know what data are we collecting, how are we collecting the data, all the nuts. We it, I think there's a general consensus that we all want this. We all we want to reduce uh, you know the uh, carbon emissions in our our community. The how of it is um, still taking some time. Thanks, Aaron. I I see Rebecca has jumped on. Yeah, Commissioner Hess, I just thought I would um, kind of back up what Aaron was saying and, and give you a couple solid dates that we are also going to be presenting in front of the commission. So uh, in another couple of weeks, we will be at the admin and small groups to be able to give you a flavor of the outline and the draft that would be coming in front of you. And on October 5th, we will be doing um, a city commission presentation that may include uh, Aaron Wright as well, uh, or Denise Keel, uh, along with some staff. And, and we really hope that uh, we will be doing our internal staff review in October. So uh, absolutely, we hope to have something by the end of the year, but it will depend on uh, your comfort level as Aaron was speaking about the data and what we have available because of, of COVID, many of the delays and the things that have happened, we certainly don't wanna go forward with anything that someone is uncomfortable with. We do feel that many of the climate change outline, the problems are outlined. Uh, the problems we don't need engagement on, it's the solutions. And so it's really, what do we want the uh, sustainability plan to look like? Uh, will it be like many of our other Imagine Kalamazoo documents, which are very action oriented? We really wanna be able to look at what are the solutions to the problems that we're trying to solve. And it may begin to look like more area wide plans that get deeper into uh, where we um, see the data leading us. So we really look forward to having that presentation to you in October. Uh, oh. Director Kick, I'm sorry to interrupt here, Commissioner. Mm -hmm. I know we all know each other more or less on this call here, but because there might be other people watching, just mm -hmm. if you would uh, remind people what your responsibility is with the city, if you just jump on, do you want to do that, Director Kick? Absolutely. Thank you, Mayor Anderson. Um, my name is Rebecca Kick. I am the Director of Community Planning and Academic Development. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Hess, go Thank ahead. Thank you, Rebecca. Yeah, um, I, I know there are other questions. Uh, we've recently been hearing about the, the tree cutting for the consumers' lines, and I would be remiss in um, if we didn't actually address that. And I know there are folks on here from Consumers Power, so um, can you please talk about that? And 
is it necessary? Like how necessary is it that we um, lose that tree cover? This, there you go. Sam, we you to turn it over to, oh, there we go. There you go. Um, I, don't, I don't know if uh, Amy or Sam want to jump on here as well, but um, essentially what's happening is with this expansion, uh, we're having to do some redesign of the line that serve both uh, graphics plant and the uh, wastewater treatment plant as well. Um, so there is a uh, high voltage substation that's on the east side of the river. Determined that um, both of those will be served uh, from that substation on the east side of the river. Um, and so what, the, what that's doing is requiring um, two new lines to be brought in across the river. Um, and those lines, because they are a high voltage line, um, it does require tree clearing uh, to prevent, you know, trees uh, falling in those lines. So uh, functionally uh, 80 feet uh, strip for each of those lines. And uh, there are there now, we did take a look at it. We did determine, you know, um, that, that the old roots uh, would work in terms of clearances with uh, other structures on property or clearances with other high voltage lines that are there. Um, and so functionally, uh, you know, that, that was one of the concerns that was raised initially by the tree committee was, um, you know, is this the route you have to take? And we did go back and take a look at that. And uh, uh, we've really determined that this is uh, the route that that we'll need to take and make sure that there is reliable uh, power for this project. I'm just or, gonna jump in. I'm gonna, Commissioner Hess, I'm sorry, I'm gonna jump in that's here all right, a second. for the expansion? So, uh, so just for a moment here, I just wanna remind, you know, uh, Derek Knopf's from Consumers Energy mentioned the tree committee. So I wanna make sure that when we know who is being talked about, so not only I mean, does the work happen at the city from the city commission level? We have very active citizen boards that also serve as resources to the city commission. So Aaron Wright is here representing the Environmental Concerns Committee, but also there is something called the Tree Committee at the city of Kalamazoo, another set of volunteers that evaluate tree removal and that sort of thing. So just want to make sure that people are aware that that is a volunteer group at the city that also evaluates and informs us related to that work. So uh, Mr. Knopf, uh, just say just a moment. So how does that happen? You go to the tree committee and, uh, and you have an interaction there, correct? Correct. Um, we've identified and I can let our, we have our, our foresters on the call as well, Stansler, but um, basically identify the, you know, that strip, we identify how many trees are there, you know, uh, there was a third part evaluator that came in and evaluated all the species of trees and the value of those trees. We pay the city for the value of those trees. Um, and that was uh, approved by the tree committee. Thank you, Mr. Thomas. Yeah, I'm sorry, Commissioner Hess, go ahead. No, that's fine. Uh, thank you, Mr. Knopf. Any other questions, Commissioner? Commissioner Hess, all right, all set. Uh, Commissioner Urban. You're muted, Jeff. I wanted to, yeah, there I wanted to follow up on the, uh, on the uh, tree clearing business. Um, I think what, one of the major concerns from the people that, that were writing to me about it was the uh, climate effect of removing those trees. Uh, does, uh, is there any commitment from consumers power or from graphic packaging or from the city to, uh, to somehow compensate the, the uh, environment for the removal of those trees in terms of planting uh, additional trees and uh, where would they go and how many uh, are we talking about here? Uh, because uh, obviously uh, in our society, trees are going to get cut down. Uh, question is, uh, what's the net effect of all that? So program at Consumers Energy, a tree grant program, he has been the, uh, has benefited uh, the past two years with receiving that tree grant program. 
Um, we also, as part of our Clean Energy Plus past year, uh, we had people uh, sign up to be part of the Clean Energy Plan. We plant a tree in their name. Uh, so it's 2,500 trees. Uh, and while not in the city, uh, it is in Zoo County, actually, it was the site selected for the entire Michigan to plant those trees. So um, those are the two uh, programs that we have uh, at Consumers Energy for uh, tree replacement. And again, that's apart from the, uh, the, the money for the trees uh, that was approved by the tree committee that we'd be paying you know, for the value of those trees. Mr. Urban, yes. other questions? Yes. Uh, well, are, are, are these trees that are, we're, are to be removed, are they on city property or are they on uh, graphic packaging property? Uh, who, who actually owns the land that the trees are on? The, just in question here is the, uh, the graphic pack, or I'm sorry, the city property. Okay. So the city could uh, undertake... Uh, uh, a tree planting program itself to make make up the difference. Is could it not? Correct. Okay, thank you. Other questions, Commissioner Urban? Not at this time. Okay. Commissioners, Vice Mayor, other questions? Vice Mayor Griffin. If I can get to my unmute, sorry about that. Um, I don't have questions right this minute. I just have a few comments um, just to the project overall. So just echoing the thank yous uh, for everyone putting the information together and presenting it, all the layers and levels that goes into this. Um, that's definitely appreciated for clarity. Um, one of the comments I have um, is to one of the callers um, and just in terms of the comments that have been happening here um, it shouldn't be an either or in terms of either we improve our economy and our economic situation and improve jobs <clears throat> or we care about our citizens and their health and, and things like that. It's got to be a both and. And so um, that's just something that <clears throat> I said I, I wanted to comment to. And also in terms of all of the, um, the information uh, which there is a great deal of. The one major component that has been missing is the people, um, the actual human lives and, and what's been happening with that. Um, and so I think that's probably one of the greatest factors here as a community, um, you know, what's happening in real time in real life with the folks who have had to endure these smells. Um, you know, I grew up on the east side on Hotop, I'm very familiar. I live north now, so it's not too much an escape from it. Um, but again, as we continue to discuss facts and figures and measurements and collections, just let's not forget about the people, um, the actual people in this process. And so I, I do have more as we go through this, but I just wanted to say that at this point. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Uh, other questions from commissioners at this time? I just want to give everybody a chance who hasn't spoken first. Commissioner Cunningham, to, no question. Oh, I just wanted to follow up on, on Vice Mayor Griffin's point um, that, it, that it is about the people. And Ken, is, is there hope? Uh, to those of you who are speaking from, an, from a graphics perspective or from the wastewater treatment plant perspective, is there actual hope now? of mitigating the odors that are have been plaguing this area for years? Is, is, is there hope? Are you gonna give us hope? Yes, we are. I mean, that's our plan. Um, that's the commitment we've made. Um, and we know that there's progress is expected and, uh, and we're working towards that. We're, uh, we're, we're gonna be surgical with this, if you will. We have to make sure <clears throat> that we're working on the right stuff. Um, graphic has done some things in the past, but um, um, you know we're committed to do what it takes to you know and what is appropriate as we go forward here. So, um, it, this commission has exerted their authority in this process, and you've laid out your expectations, the community, and that's been you know communicated through you from the community. So we understand that.
Uh, Commissioner Cunningham? No? All right. Any other questions at this point then for the presenters? All right, I don't see any other questions. So seeing none, there's a recommended action and that is a motion to adopt the resolution. Is there a motion? Motion is being made by Commissioner Urban. Is there a second for that motion? Seconded by Commissioner Hess. All right, is there discussion now on that motion? Well, yes. Uh, Commissioner Urban. Well, I, uh, I moved, uh, I, I made that motion with the intention of um, uh, offering an amendment to it, which is uh, essential uh, in my opinion to uh, gaining my uh, uh, okay on this whole thing. And so uh, if we could go ahead with uh, considering that amendment, then we can consider, then uh, approving that or not, then we can go uh, ahead with dealing with the, uh, the main motion as it's amended, if it's amended. All right, Commissioner Urban. Attorney Robinson, do you need to weigh in on this at all? No, is it's appropriate uh, at this point to make an amendment. All right. Okay. Uh, All right well, so are you prepared for an amendment then, Commissioner Urban? Yes, I am. All right. Okay, here we go. Uh, I move to amend the resolution before us to approve the PA 198 Industrial Facilities Tax Exemption Certificate for a period of six years, allowing for the possibility of its, of its extension for an additional six years, contingent upon review of progress made toward commitments presented this evening. Now, when I, the commitments I'm referring to are the completion of the, uh, uh, the four uh, odor control units that the city has uh, responsibility for and contingent upon getting the performance of the uh, uh, underground piping to, to uh, uh, mitigate the problem that's actually uh, originates with graphics packaging, but emanates from city property. So uh, it's, it's uh, I, I, I expect, um, significant uh, reduction in odors uh, by the time these two projects are completed. And uh, we'll have a, a period of time within that six year window to see uh, uh, major uh, improvement. Uh, if we don't see major improvement, well then uh, the, that's the end of it. Uh, but I fully expect that the, these uh, engineering solutions are going to be uh, largely successful. And I'm, I'm really uh, uh, counting on that. And uh, I think that uh, if this whole thing is approved, uh, the whole community is going to be counting on it. So Gravix Packaging has a huge uh, uh, stake in making this all work. And so does the city of Kalamazoo. We are really uh, joined to the hip on this problem. Thank you, Commissioner Urban. Did you happen to, to craft that motion yourself at this time? Yes, man? I did. Yes, okay. I did. So, 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 I, so I'm going to jump attorney, in here. The attorney can modify it if he has to. I, okay. just, I just wanted to get it going. All right. Thank you. So I don't want to mess the flow up here on this, but uh, I think that j just to back up just a moment here is that every time that there is a resolution to grant a PA-198, there are expectations that are built into that resolution, and those expectations are, uh, if not, you know, if basically if not followed, then those expectations allow a body to pull back that, uh, that a relationship that provides for that abatement for a period of time. So in our current resolution, uh, there are some fairly standard uh, items in there. If you look through our agenda packet here that allow us to do that. 
And those are three categories at this moment as it stands. And those items are one, uh, rel you know, related to a timeliness on the actual activity of developing the project. Another portion of it is related to the commitments that are made uh, relative to the employment uh, commitments made relative to the project. And I would say the third one is related to the fact that the project does what it is intended to do. In other words, this is a recycling undertaking and not something else. So uh, just related to your uh, motion, uh, Commissioner Urban, is that in, in, in sort of prior discussions and thinking about this work, you know, I've had some discussions also related to should there be a fourth component in this particular resolution that we're contemplating uh, tonight that would more specifically address some of the concerns we've been talking about related to the work on odor, environmental issues, and that kind of thing. So to that end, Commissioner Urban, I actually asked uh, our city staff to also prepare some language to get to that fourth point. So one of the positives about that is that you incorporate uh, you know, language like this in our resolution, then that gives us real time opportunity, you know, to verify and to uh, evaluate whether the commitment that results, you know, in this 198, you know, tax break is, you know, worthy of continuation. So that said, there was some work done on that, Commissioner Urban, and I'd be wondering if you'd be willing, that was sent to us via email, so I don't know if you saw that or not. It was not long before the meeting, but would it be okay to allow that language, you know, to be expressed now? And maybe you can see, Commissioner Urban, whether that meets your intent and what you're trying to do here. Would that be okay? Sure. Okay. Um, who has that pulled up right now who would be willing to read that? Uh, Mayor, I, I've got it in front of me. Okay. Uh, and I, the language would read this, it would be an amendment to paragraph four of the resolution to provide the, an initial exemption certificate period of six years and an additional period of six years upon sufficient evidence of compliance with the local agreement by graphic packaging, including installation of odor monitoring sensors by graphic packaging, compliance with state and federal regulations, and working in good faith with the city's odor task force to implement corrective actions as necessary. Then the city manager is further directed to provide quarterly reports to the city commission on the progress of odor remediation efforts by graphic packaging and the city wastewater reclamation facility. Thank you, Mr. Robinson. So am I to understand that this language, we, we would amend our resolution to include this language. And if, if it is determined in the future that this language, you know, the, the intent of this language is not being met, would that allow us then to take an action to rescind, you know, further abatement based on this, you know, PA 198 industrial tax exemption? Yes, it would. Uh... The, the initial certificate of six years would, would be in place as the additional six years would be uh, dependent upon compliance with the additional material that uh, was added to the uh, proposal. So am I misunderstanding to think that if that the, the, it was not complied with, we could not end it anytime earlier than six years? For example, it's a six year proposal. We could not say you're not meeting the requirements at, you know, two years or four years and say, as a result of that, uh, you know, we are truncating the period of time that we provided for this. That's a good question. And I, I guess I would, while you can read it that way, um, it's not as clear as I would have liked, I would like. In other words, if it were rewritten written, to be clearer, then you could do that? Yes. Okay. If you wouldn't mind, 
Do you have, can you look at that language and make sure that's absolutely clear? I, I hate to try to figure this out right in real time here, but I think it would be important. Do you mind? No, that's, that's okay. Okay. So in general, then I, I'm, I'm sort of getting in the way of here things because I guess, uh, Commissioner Urban, do you want, you, you want to continue ahead with your amendment? Well, uh, let me just say that uh, I'm, I'm, I like Attorney uh, uh, Robinson's uh, uh, version a lot better than mine. Uh, so I'm, I'm perfectly willing to uh, just replace uh, my proposal with his. Uh, I, I think that uh, we need some clarification from the MEDC about whether uh, there, you, we can legally put in clawback provisions for something that happens within the first six, six years. But if you word it in such a way that uh, uh, we can do this subject to uh, compliance with state regulations, uh, then clearly that's a, a good uh, additional assurance to, uh, to, inc to incorporate. So uh, basically I'm saying, Clyde, uh, go for it. Okay, I, I'm, I'm noodling through it. Just give me a few more uh, minutes here. Okay, Commissioner Cunningham. I wanna also, um, one, once that is set up, I wanna make a uh, amendment to that timeline. Um, instead of six, six, I want it to be one, two, three, and then six um, for a couple of reasons. Um, so as you mentioned, Mayor Anderson, this, this agreement is the uh, standard by which they will um, be held, to, held up, accountable to. Um, and I know that on the, I know, I know we have the state and the federal verbiage in there and then it kind of comes into the local. On the state and the federal level, I think a lot of those um, definitions are, are, are already out there and guidelines are out there. But as it pertains to the city, I think we still have too many question marks on the smell, where it's coming from, how it's affecting our community and things of that nature. Um, so a couple components that came to mind with that, with that change. Uh, with a one, two year, um, with a one year um, revisit, revisit uh, I, I will hope between now and one year, um, we can get better clarity on expectations from the city, um, whether it's on the city side of uh, potentially smell or graphic packaging side of the smell. Um, and then the other piece is two years after that, uh, we'll at least give somebody from this particular commission body a chance to revisit the conversation. Um, you know, often we find we, we switch administrations and we lose a lot of, um, we lose a lot of, um, you know, some of that internal knowledge uh, because of the switching of administrations. Uh, and I think this will give us at least two more opportunities to sit down, reevaluate, uh, and, and maybe that'll help remove some of the subjectivity uh, creates more accountability and keeps uh, gives us as a community more opportunity to um, to weigh in on our expectations and whether we need to add or subtract anything within that agreement. Um, so whenever Clyde does uh, come up with that, uh, I will be motioning to add that timeline. In. Thank you, Commissioner Cunningham. Any other thoughts for uh, Vice Mayor Griffin? I was just going to echo what Commissioner Cunningham said as Clyde, as Attorney Robinson is working on the language um, for that fourth component that you lifted up, Mayor, um, that there needs to be specific timelines, um, also specific report outs to community um, within that, within that, and I think it does need to be spelled out, um, whether that's quarterly reports. Um, I think a year is too long to get the initial report, but I definitely support, you know, as far as a year. Uh, as Commissioner Cunningham has lifted up. So yes, what you said, Mayor, in terms of adding that fourth component and addressing the time and uh, having be very clear uh, with those dates. Thank you, Vice Mayor Griffin. I'm gonna speak slowly so oh, any, Robinson any, can continue any, to Anytime you're ready. No, I, I think I've got it. I, I wanna- uh, I first... have one more thought. I'm sorry, Attorney <laughs> Robinson. Did you wanna speak, Commissioner Cunningham? 
oh, I just wanted to provide a line of clarity. I do expect the quarterly updates. Um, it, it's just that we'll revisit the, the resolution in the year in case there are some amendments that we would like to make um, on a one, two years after that, three years after that, and then they can have the six pending. You know, we, we've uh, come to some strong um, work between that time. Thank you. Okay, Attorney Robinson. Okay, first, this is, this is not all my effort. I, I, I want to give um, appreciation and uh, thanks to um, Deputy City Manager Chamberlain for, for making a suggestion as I was working through this. So it would be a, a two step, uh, it would amend two portions of the resolution. The first is a, would be the motion to um, amend paragraph 2B to add the phrase in, near the after the word application uh, or failure to meet the requirements set forth in this resolution. So it would, it would this paragraph 2B would read, failure to provide the requested information by June 30th, failure to complete the project within two years, failure to proceed in good faith with the project consistent with the purpose of 1974 Public Act 198, failure to create or retain jobs as presented in the application or failure to use the project in the manner as described in the application. Those are all the factors that you mentioned earlier, Mayor. And this we would add, or failure to meet the requirements set forth in this resolution shall be grounds for revocation of the certificate. Then paragraph four would be amended to read, uh, to provide the industrial facilities tax exemption certificate for the construction of a new facility unless earlier revoked shall be in effect for a period for an initial for, for an initial exemption certificate period of six years an additional period of six years and then we would go on that the conditions would be including the installment of odor monitoring sensors compliance with state and federal regs working in good faith with the city's odor task force, and then requiring the city manager to provide quarterly reports. Now that's as, as it was initially suggested. I, I, before we move to consideration of Commissioner Cunningham's changes, I think we, we would probably be best to at least adopt this uh, because while you can amend an amendment, that's as far as you can go. You can't make you can't go one step further. If that's what you're, on the other hand, if that's what you wish to do, you want to incorporate Commissioner Cunningham's suggestions. Uh, at this point, that's okay, uh, but it you you can you can act, actually can, can adopt this and then return to his suggestion later on. I, I leave it up to you how you want to approach that. Thank you very much for your quick work, Attorney Robinson, uh, Commissioner Cunningham. I would just ask that my colleagues vote that down. Um, and then I'll make a motion with all of the same language with just different years. Uh, one of the things I also wanna uh, dig deeper into um, when it comes to discussion is, um, I know we're talking about you know remediating the smell, uh, but I think it's, while we have all of the major players in the room, I think it's a good opportunity to just talk about health, uh, potential health effects in the community. Um, so I think that's another dialogue that we should have. But uh, once again, I ask that all my colleagues vote this down. I will motion uh, the exact same language with just the change in the year. So Commissioner Cunningham. Well, if, if rather than, than jumping through those hoops, you, if you wish, you can, um, he can propose an amendment to the amendment. Then I will propose the amendment to switch from six and six to one, two, three, six. So just, I, I may, may have missed something. I'm sorry, Commissioner Urban. So was Commissioner Urban's motion actually seconded? No. I don't think it was. No, it, it wasn't. So we don't have a motion to vote down. Yeah. Right. Okay. Okay. It, unless I'm missing something. But, but there should be a second to com, to the the motion of Commissioner Urban. 
I would suggest you do that. And then Commissioner Cunningham can make his motion to change the uh, periods. I'll second it. All right. So Commissioner Urban's motion is seconded. I'm yeah. going to assume that Commissioner Cunningham is going to make his motion to change the periods of to one year and additional periods of two years, three years, and six years upon sufficient evidence of compliance. For a total of 12. Uh, Commissioner Urban. Well, that, I think that's, uh, that's a good rigor to, uh, to add to the thing. But let's re remember that most of what has to happen is you're re basically we're committing uh, the city to do a lot of this, this work. Graf we're, we're making graphic packaging kind of like to be the goat here because uh, part of the, the, the odor does actually does emanate from uh, their, their sewage, but it's aerosolized and ventilated into the atmosphere uh, through the city's uh, property. So let's just be clear here that this uh, extra uh, uh, amendments that we're adding are not intended to be necessarily punitive to, toward uh, graphic packaging, but rather a, an expression of the city commission's uh, thorough commitment to live up to its end of the bargain too. Uh, that's 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 the only way I'm going to be able to vote for this. Is is it's pretty clear that uh, uh, the city is uh, making a big commitment as well as graphics packaging, and uh, we have to be. Uh, I'm 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 confident that the uh, director Baker is is believing that what he's embarking on will work. But uh, what Mr. Cunningham has done is saying, well, we I want verification that it'll work. Well, that's Perfectly uh, acceptable. That's uh, that's saying uh, trust but verify. That's that's what we want. So with that said, uh, let's proceed. Uh, for the discussion, then, Commissioner Pradle. I'm well, sorry, you, Robinson. Before yeah. you go further, you need a second to commission second Mr. It. Cunningham's motion. I'll second it. Okay. Okay. So here's something that happens, and I'm here in the midst of all this, and I think it could be a little more difficult if you're watching, but it starts to feel a little bit like one of those which cup is the, you know, coin under sort of the games. So I just want to make sure, you know, we got a motion on a motion. So where exactly for everyone paying attention here is, is what's going on exactly. So... Help me with this here. We have a motion. That you have, a, if, if I may, Mayor, you have a motion to amend the resolution. Are you frozen, Clyde, or is that the end? Okay. I, I, I'm. I, if I'm frozen, I, I don't know that. Uh, okay. You, you, you. What you have is a a motion to amend the resolution. Or the wording of the resolution. All right. Commissioner Pradle, then, so we have it, so that motion is supported, seconded. Uh, Commissioner Pradle. Yeah, I was just going to share, you know, I appreciate the spirit of that uh, uh, amendment on the motion. Um, 12 years, in my eyes, is totally too long. Um, you know, it's a long time in terms of especially a mutual accountability. My reservation is is especially when it's coming to one in two years, the two main capital improvement projects that are meant to be the main thrust of changing the odor, uh, the one that was passed and appropriated in 2018 isn't even going to take effect until early 2021. So, but, you know, in terms of having a whole full year to actually measure its effectiveness, that wouldn't start until 2021. And then phase two, which is another $4 million of uh, capital improvements that's meant to mitigate the smell, which is like the vacuum vacuuming of the, um, I can't remember the terminology, Director Baker, you can correct me, but that won't take effect until I think it's until second quarter uh, 2022. So second quarter 2022, we're talking somewhere between April, you know, May, June range to even have that into effect. And so in terms of the accountability that we're talking about, how effective is our accountability measures if for the next two years, we're rolling out the measures that are meant to mitigate the odors. 
I guess, if that's my question. Mr. Cunningham. Uh, so to Commissioner Prado, there are some um, other studies that should be coming out within the year, um, actually before the end of this year. Uh, one, two, um, once again, I think it's, it's an opportunity for us to check in uh, specifically in front of the community and to, um, you know, see what information or what, what we can potentially speak to. So with my amendment, you'll, this will be brought before the commission to review our agreement uh, and or make changes uh, if necessary or not uh, in 2021, um, which is next year. And then again, uh, during your last year of administration, um, before you leave, uh, which will be 2023, which would be about a year after uh, a lot of those things are in place. So I think that uh, it's still a strong timeline. Um, and once again, you know, we brought this up in August and we, we, I still don't feel comfortable with all of the information and the opportunity to get more information within that two month timeline. Um, and so this is kind of a almost opportunity to just revisit it and give it a year timeline to, 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 to dig deeper into the information and, um, and see if there's anything that we might have missed uh, even on tonight. Thanks, Commissioner Cunningham. Uh, other thoughts? Other discussion on this? Commissioner Cunningham. Um, for which I wanted to say, Chris, uh, and, and I apologize to my colleagues, because typically, um, you know, I try to get an amendment out to you before we actually go into meetings. Um, but this is kind of uh, this, my decision to even make an amendment didn't happen until about five o'clock today. Uh, but that being said, another thing that I, I really want to take into uh, scope with this opportunity um, whether it be on the city side, whether it be in this actual resolution is, you know, the health effects on our community. Uh, one of the frustration about, frustrations about the air quality control piece is it's not as um, measurable as, say, our water uh, system, uh, for which I love when Jane Baker, uh, Director Baker uh, speaks because he just, he, he can easily, uh, you know, paint the picture to say, hey, um, you know, these are the numbers, these are the expectations, and this is who, what, where, when, and why, um, because we control most of that, that, that component as it pertains to our city. Um, but when it comes to air quality, you know, it, it's, it's, a, it's a different type of thing. So I, I would be curious to, to, as an East Side kid and an individual who spent 90% of my life within a three block radius on the East Side of town, uh, you know, I would be curious to, to, to get a better understanding, if, if only for, uh, I know we've been talking about quality of life, but um, stressors in general is, is a, to me is a health uh, mm -hmm. issue. And, you know, if only for clarity of mind, um, if we can get some more studies that will define what potential hazards we've been exposed to. Um, I know I've sat in on meetings and Director Baker explained to me, you know, uh, as to our knowledge, based on all of the measurements that we've put in place over at least his, his time, um, we're, you know, completely beyond, uh, you know, safe. Um, but, you know, I, I, I would like for more measures in place and more definitive uh, understanding surrounding that. Uh, and, and Director Baker, you can kick in any time because I don't, I don't really have that uh, 100% uh, um, communication on that component as, as say you would. Yeah, thank you, Commissioner Cunningham. And, and, and Mayor, if I may, I, I think I might be able to provide some additional um, contacts that will help both the commissioners with kind of both the comments that we just heard. Um, you know, first to kind of back up a little bit in, in that to understand that um, compound compositions within water are completely different than compound compositions in air. Um, let me articulate that a little bit better in that if I've got a fish tank, say there's a fish tank in the, the atrium of the wastewater treatment plant, if I mix up some Kool-Aid and dump it in that fish tank, um, given agitation and uh, a certain amount of time, 
all the fish will be drinking the same amount of Kool-Aid. Now, if I explode a Kool-Aid gas bomb in the admin building of the wastewater treatment plant, those sitting downstairs might be affected more than those sitting in the back room or me in my office or somewhere else. Um, the concentration of gases in gases uh, becomes very difficult. You've got to understand what the boiling point of that gas is. You've got to understand what the molecular weight of that gas is. And your reading is only accurate at the point where the reading is being taken. That being said, we've got three community sensors right now. We've got Burberg Park. We've got East Michigan at Riverview. We've got Borges Hospital. That's the data that we have. That data is only accurate for those locations. Conversely, we've got a lot of data inside the chambers and inside the pipes. We know that the, those gases and the concentration inside the chambers and inside the pipes is not what the community is exposed to. We also understand that the entire community does not live in Verberg Park or East Michigan at Riverview or Borges Hospital. So um, one of the things that we're planning to get out rather quickly here, and it's gonna kind of span uh, in the near term and then throughout 2021, is more sensors in the community, um, not only the city, but also GPI, um, and then some of the continued collaboration of um, those data sets. Getting more data and having the opportunity to provide that data to universities, to regulatory agencies, to um, PhD researchers, medical PhD researchers, um, is really gonna get to the point of answering the question of what are the potential health and safety concerns of the community. And that's something that we can really get started on over the next six to 12 months. Did, uh, was that helpful, Commissioner Cunningham? Was for me, I know. All right. So any other questions or discussion then on the motion that's on the floor, Commissioner Cunningham? Uh, I don't have any questions or really discussions about the motion. Um, I guess my comment is more for city administration. Um, you know, I, I really want you guys to take a lead on this opportunity. I know that we have a subcommittee uh, that, that is doing work. Uh, a special thank you to uh, that citizen who is uh, a part of that work. I won't mention his name just because I don't know if he wants that to be public information, but he's been doing that fight for, for quite some time now. Been very intentional on taking every step uh, possible on behalf of our community. So I just want to say thank you for that. Um, and just to, you know, uh, encourage the city to, you know, not be scared of the work, um, not be hesitant with the work. Uh, and if you need any assistance, please reach out to the community um, because this has to be a, a collective effort. Um, and I think that's going to be, you know, I, I love the way uh, uh, Director Kick put it. Uh, you know, we know the problems. How do we get to those solutions? Um, and that's where we're at right now. We know where the, we know the problem. We just have to get to the solution of it. Thanks again, Commissioner Cunningham. I appreciate that. Commissioner Urban. There we go. There we go. I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, I just like to add that uh, the intent, the effect of this uh, amendment is basically uh, to for, to commit the city uh, to do its absolute uh, maximum due diligence to get this odor under control very quickly, uh, and. Uh, we're basically holding graphic packaging uh, tax exemption hostage to the city doing its job. Uh, as long as uh, people have that understanding uh, that uh, uh, we're committing to graphics packaging to protect their uh, tax abatement by doing what we have to be doing, what we should have been doing for years. Uh, so, um, um, the thrust of most of what's going on is directed at the city, not at graphics packaging. The graphics packaging uh, tax abatement is the occasion that has brought this issue forward. Uh, 
graphics packaging is implicated. Gra graphics packaging is uh, a source, uh, not the only source. So uh, I just want people to understand what we're what, uh, the complications of uh, the multiple responsibilities that we have here in the community between the private and the public sectors. Commissioner, thank you, Commissioner Irwin. Commissioner Pradle. Yeah, I, I just, the part that I'm still struggling with is like, what are you holding accountable in the short term if the accountability is on the basis of, of measuring, you know, the, to, your, to your point, Commissioner uh, Cunningham, you said, you know, that we, we know the problems, but we're trying to get to the solution. And we know, and, and the, the next solution in terms of all this invest, investigative and groundwork is this $8 million worth of, you know, capital improvement upgrades. And then, and ultimately, in terms of having to actually have that plant built, you know, because we don't even, you know, we could start, we could start holding the accountability now, but until the plant is built, what are we, what are we holding accountable and measuring yet? So I guess I, it just feels like it's the cart before the horse kind of thing in terms of how you hold something accountable when it's not there yet, when you, the solution that you have to measure isn't, isn't even implemented yet, I guess, if that makes any sense. And in terms of the short term, I mean, in part of the resolution, there's four quarterly reports. There's a report out that they that says they have to come back to us from Eagle on November 8th. And so, you know, those are going to be also opportunities for accountability too, that I feel like we can do in the short term before those capital improvements are out where we can measure. That's just my only point. Any other discussion? Vice Mayor Griffin. Um, yes, I, I just wanted to chime in and Commissioner Pradle and Commissioner Cunningham, I do, I, I'm understanding your points and I'm understanding where you're coming from, um, Commissioner Pradle. I think one of the things that I'm thinking about is um, from a community standpoint, you know, it's, I think it's amazing that we're finally getting to a point that something's happening, but it's been generations, right? And so now we're talking about you know, life expectancy changing and all these other things. And so now we're at this point where, you know, it sounds like we might be able to do something about it. And if there's not, it's not enough to just hope for it or just, you know, cross our fingers and say, well, maybe in a, in a few years with these improvements, we probably, we need to build in that extra pad of comfort because we don't have, we haven't done anything. Um, and so I don't, I don't think it's enough to just say, well, you know, in a couple years when they, you know, do these millions of dollars of improvements that that we can start measuring then because that would call, we would be ignoring um, the feelings of, of people who have been going through this for quite some time. Um, and I do appreciate Commissioner Cunningham, what you lifted up about, you know, the health and what's happening with, with the community of, of the people and their livelihoods, because again, in these two years or whatever many years that this is gonna happen, people still are living every day. You know, they're still breathing every day. Um, and, and what about that? And so I think we have to, it's our responsibility to find that balance between what we're working with right now. And so I think that's, that's part of where that responsibility is um, with that part. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Any other discussion on this motion? Commissioner Prater? So I guess I, my question is, is when we get back here a year from now, how are we going to determine success? So if nothing's, if nothing's changed because we're waiting on, on capital and eight, four million and then $8 million of capital improvements, and we're just, just now implementing the measures for longitudinal studies, what is success going to look like? So, Mr. Cunningham, yes, I'm, I'm so sorry. Yeah, um, good. Thank you, Mayor. Um, so, once again, um, Commissioner Prado, there's another study that's coming out relatively soon. We're making a decision before that study. We don't know what that study will say. Study may say nothing's wrong at all, uh, but the study could come back and say there's three different things that's wrong. And as of right now, we are only addressing two of them with the capital improvements that we have going along. Um, and, you know, I, you, you mentioned we will get those quarterly reports, but those quarterly reports doesn't bring forth. So, so if we go with the six, um, 
our, our binding agreement is to say between now and those six years, this is the agreement we handshaking with graphics packaging to say, these are the only the things that you got to live by within the next six years. And yes, I appreciate your quarterly report to us, but we're not going to reevaluate that. Or we could just go back on our word, bring it back to the table and, and do X, Y, and Z. But I would not, I, I would rather be upfront on expectations is that I'm going to review you within a year. I'm going to review you within three years and, and, and so forth and so forth. So, um, so I, I think that's the component, two components that, that, uh, that I think are valuable. Um, you may not find them to be valuable, but for me, uh, you know, once again, I, you hit it on the head, uh, Vice Mayor, this is generations. Uh, when I was, when in the 90s, I didn't have a voice to, to, to communicate that I was tired of smelling this. I didn't have a voice that I, I, to communicate that I went to sleep with this in my, and what I felt in my mouth. Um, so those are some of the components. And now that my father is, my father has developed COPD and never smoked a day in his life lived on that side of town his entire life. Um, and I'm not saying there's a direct correlation, but what I'm saying is, what if it was? And so for peace of mind, and, and now for me, I don't think that that's the case, but with my father, but I'm sure there are people across this community who have that concern and it's a peace of mind thing. Uh, that's the health factor, right? And that's the reason why I said, not only do we, we right now we're focusing in on, you know, the, the, the older, the potential gases, how it may affect health and mediating those things. But I think we should also, you know, put in that extra component, um, maybe not on the graphics packaging end, but but on the city, we should have a deeper dialogue um, concerning maybe some some steps and some measures we can go in and look at health and, and determine um, it, it, is there, were there some type of uh, give and take in effect. Um, so, I, you know, what that looks like, I don't know. That that kind of goes into a deeper education, and we only have two months to really, really dig deep into uh, what I think has been a community concern for years. And I know I've been working on this since 2015, and in five years, I don't feel like the needles move much beyond, um, you know, there was a couple tests that that took place, and there was a committee that's been formed, but I don't feel that the needle has moved much. So. Um, so those are kind of the components that I, I think are, are, are valuable. Maybe they aren't um, for you, but for me, uh, it's not putting the cart before a horse under any circumstance, whether it be for the community or whether it be for graphics packaging. I wouldn't want to have them report out to us quarterly. And then in two years, uh, I'm going to say, you know, I feel like you're not doing right based on whose opinion. But if we can at least in one year say, OK, I know we said this, but let's make some tweaks. This is the expectation. And then in two years after that, then we say, OK, well, I know we said this, but let's make some uh, uh, tweaks and expectation, whether it be on our end or their end. Um, and I, for me, that's that's the least we can do for our community and the members that are in our community um, versus and, and that's respect for graphics packaging by saying, I'm not going to pull you, pull your coattail two years in, and I shook on an agreement that I wasn't going to pull your coattail for six. Um, so that's kind of how I view it. Thank you, Commissioner Cunningham. Commissioner Urban. Well, I, I, I'm trying to uh, uh, understand what Commissioner Cunningham uh, wants, and I would like very much to uh, endorse what he's after. Uh, he's talking about a, a report that's due. Uh, apparently, it's already been commissioned, and it's going to uh, come out in the next year, which uh, may shed some uh, light on a, uh, additional work that may be needed to, to actually uh, get on top of the odor problem. And what he's suggesting is, uh, let's, let's uh, uh, look at that data and be, be prepared to use it. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm good with that, but let's remember that uh, we're dealing uh, with, as, as, uh, commission, as uh, Director Baker said, uh, co concentrations in air, uh, since the, it's not, it can't be well mixed like you can in a fish, fish tank, uh, there's a lot more subjectivity that can arise if we uh, allow uh, ourselves to be uh, moved around a lot by perceptions of human beings. Uh, I want to lay great stress on whatever we do with uh, uh, 
asking for additional reports and shorter timelines is that it be based on technical data, it based on, be based on uh, monitoring data, and if we need more monitoring stations to complete the, uh, fill in the gaps, we get the monitoring stations. But uh, it's our decision is in order to be fair to everybody, have got to be based on objective data, uh, uh, and and uh, uh, with with allowance for subjectivity, but not domination by it. That's just uh, that's just the, the the engineer and me talking. That's all. Thank you, but Commissioner. Still... So, just Commissioner Hess, did you have? Um, Aaron, I'd like to hear what Aaron has to say. Okay. Uh, thanks. I just wanted to jump in, Commissioner Pradell. Uh, Pradell, I hear you asking what what uh, you know what will be we be able to measure, or you know what information would we be able to collect after say a year's time versus you know if this project is going to take two or three years on on the city's end my understanding in terms of uh packaging is they have three separate environmental studies going on right now so in a year's time hopefully they would be able to communicate um the results of those studies and any actions that they are putting in the works um based on those studies one of those studies is is under you know under kind of threat of enforcement from from Eagle, so that that's a that's a state thing, and then the it, my understanding of it is that uh, uh, two of their environmental studies are related to the open air clarifier. So we've been talking about this junction chamber for many years as a, a main source of the odor, um, but the Jones and Henry report also references, um, they have a massive open air vat um, of water that is, is used in their processes that's full, filled uh, with uh, organic material that goes into to making the paper. Um, the, the Jones and Henry study mentions that that open air clarifier is a, a probable source of odor. Graphic packaging is doing environmental studies on that specific uh, source point um, and, and so there, there is quite a bit of information and, and planning, um, and are they being, you know, an update on how the, the interaction is going with the odor uh, task force? Is there that free flow of information uh, in, with that, uh, the odor monitoring data being collected by the city and being collected by graphics packaging? Is that actual data comparison um, uh, taking place. So in, in my best understanding is there are quite a few markers that after say a year's time, um, you, you would be able to, to review um, a, as a commission. Good. So uh, thank you, thank you, Aaron. Uh, yes, Commissioner Hess. So does this have to be, so do those markers have to be a part of our resolution tonight? No. Uh, well, I mean, I, I know that's that's the question, I guess, but as far as part of the discussion, it may be to those who made the resolution, but I mean, is that a, a hand up, think... Chris Urban? Yeah, it's just my hand. I was just holding the, the uh, my, my cell phone. I wasn't trying to get attention. Okay. I don't think there, uh, I don't think you have to add in those, those components. Um, because there may be something that comes of it, maybe nothing at all. Uh, but I just think that, uh, you know, it'll be a good opportunity to check in. And I'm not sure which one of my colleagues have actually had even the opportunity to speak to the one citizen that sits on multiple, multiple boards. Um, but, but, you know, you know, just listening to him, listening to a uh, former graphics packaging employee, uh, you know, it was interesting how, you know, two different worlds, two different professions, mm -hmm. and yet they both came to a lot of the same questions, concerns, uh, and, and things of that nature. Um, so so I, I, yeah, I, like I said, I, I really wanna support graphics packaging through this process. What they do is for the betterment of not just our community, but the United States at large. I mean, recycling is the number one thing um, that they're trying to provide here. Um, so I, 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 it's not that, you know, and, and I truly, uh, I know for a fact, uh, you know, they have very good hiring practices. 
for those who who who, um, who normally wouldn't uh, have the type of paying jobs that they provide. They give opportunities to individuals who who have you know backgrounds um, for which I can't say for most major organizations uh, paying the type of money that they pay. Um, so I'm appreciative of a lot of the things that they do, they do in the community. It's just some uh, you know, some pieces that, you know, that may be their fault, may not be their fault, may come from, you know, something that happened back in the thirties, uh, from a different organization. Um, so, you know, I think it's just a, it would be a disjustice to our community, um, not to come back and, and have a clear understanding that we're going to come back in one year or, or sooner to actually look at the app, the, the resolution that we have and say, you know, maybe they may say, hey, I want to make some amendments to this resolution and I want it to look like this. Um, but I think, you know, that that's the, there's enough information coming down the pipeline to make some potential uh, large adjustments and to have more detailed uh, expectations within a year or it may come back down the pipeline and there's nothing at all, so. Thank you, Commissioner. Yeah. Any other discussion on the amendment to the motion? All right, seeing no other discussion, just a couple comments from me then. So I, I guess from my perspective, I mean, I'll be supportive of this. Uh, I did have an opportunity to talk to Commissioner Cunningham before this meeting also, and actually that incentivized me to, and, and I don't wanna forget this, Commissioner Cunningham, is that we are also going to be inserting some very particular what I consider to be strong language into the resolution as well. So, so I, I believe that as we look at each other here, I'm going to call it, we're doing a belt and suspender approach to this. So, you know, we talked and I thought, hey, you know, there's a good set of suspenders we can put on this as adding the fourth thing in. I mean, you're coming back and saying, hey, I want a belt too. That's what I wanted. That's how I'm looking at this. So, uh, I mean, it's important that I think all the things you say, we want to be good community partners. We want GPI to be a good community partner with us. There's a lot of good things about the work they do, their commitment to the community. We want to recognize all that. But that all said, you know, we're going belt and suspenders on this thing here. So I'm going to be supportive of it. I'm going to ask us, uh, Clerk Borley, to call the roll. Uh, I'm Mayor, sorry. I want to make sure, sure okay. that you're that everybody understands what they're voting on. Since we've kind of got into a little bit of a parliamentary quagmire and there has to be also some specific language in there in order to satisfy um, the, the tax laws. So let me do this. What you're gonna be voting on is Commissioner Cunningham's amendment to change the certificate periods to one year, two years, three years, and six years. And so it'll be the language that you're asking to be to you're going to vote on next is that the uh, the exemption certificate period um, would be of the initial would be for one year commencing December 31st, 2020 and expiring December 30th, 2021 and additional periods of two years commencing December 31, 2021 and expiring December 30, 2023 three years commencing December 31, 2023 and expiring December 30, 2026 and six years commencing December 31, 2026 and expiring December 30, 2032. I, you had to put all those dates in there in order to make sure that the assessor knew when he had to do his work because December 31 is tax day. And that's why it, it, it has to run from December 31st to December 30 of the next year or the following years. Appreciate that. We don't want to make things any harder for the city assessor. Um, all right, is that clear for everyone then? Commissioner Pradel. Yeah, I just wanted to, Commissioner Cunningham, I want to thank you for having a little bit of a discussion and just you know giving me your perspective on some of those questions. I, I think you know this is just more evidentiary of why um, you know this public dialogue is so important and uh, you know, we have a chance to talk about these things in the public and ask these questions, right? Because, I mean, um, you know, there may be things, we're seven people, and, you know, I didn't serve on this, the um, the subcommittee with you, and 
um, mayor and um, Commissioner Urban, you know, and, and we all bring different perspectives. We're going to read different things while we're trying to get through, you know, giant reports and attachments. And so um, having those seven perspectives is, is pretty invaluable. And so I, I appreciate the time that you, uh, you uh, entertain my, my, my questions. So thanks. Very worthwhile comments, Commissioner Prado. Appreciate that. Uh, Clerk Borling, can you call the roll? Commissioner Urban. Yes. Vice Mayor Griffin. Yes. Mayor Anderson. Yes. Commissioner Cunningham. Yes. Commissioner Hess. Yes. Commissioner Prado. Yes. Okay. Thank you, commis thank you yeah. commissioners. I I'm sorry. I was going to say the motion passes. Did I okay. That motion passes. Now, the next motion is the one that was originally made by Commissioner Urban and supported by Commissioner Hess to add the language that would be failure to meet the requirements language to 2B and the additional language about um, installation of odor monitoring, uh, compliance with state and federal regulations, working in good faith with the odor task force and directing the city manager to provide quarterly reports. So that's the next amendment that you have to vote on. Thank you, Attorney Robinson, very helpful. Did you have something to say, Commissioner Cunningham? No, I was just gonna highlight, thank you again, uh, Mayor Anderson for you know the thought and insight on providing this portion of the, 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 um, the, the amendment. Um, and it looks like obviously uh, Commissioner Urban was on the exact same timeline in, in mind or wavelength as you. So I appreciate uh, the work on both ends. And then also Commissioner Prado, uh, I, we need to uh, checks and balances. So I appreciate, um, you know, always putting out those questions. And, and once again, to my colleagues, I always try to uh, get amendments out to you as soon as possible. Um, but once again, this is kind of a, a, a midnight hour um, suggestion. Thank you. Commissioner Cunningham. All right, any other discussion on this then? All right, Clerk Borling, please call the roll. Vice Mayor Griffin. Okay, so I checked out. This emotion, this is, we're approving the motion Eric just said, but this is wrapping this up. And be clear on what I'm, I'm saying yes to. This, we, just, this, we just approved the, the belt, now we're gonna approve the suspenders. I'm sorry, let's all right. not all talk at once. Let's have Attorney Robinson explain that again, okay? okay. What you just did was approve the, the periods. This is the motion that was originally made that actually called for a six and six, but it also required uh, for the installation of odor monitoring, compliance with state and federal regulations, working in good faith with the city's odor task force and directing the manager to provide quarterly reports. That was the original proposed amendment <clears throat> It was then subsequently amended, or a motion was made to amend it by Commissioner Cunningham. You've approved Commissioner Cunningham's motion. Now you're on to Commissioner Urban's amendment to the resolution as a whole. Once you pass this, okay. you've got one more vote after that. Okay. So that's a slight misrepresentation in that this was not Commissioner Urban's original Well, as, 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 as friendly modified. As it right. was modified. Yes, yes. Relative to the to the new language. Right. Is that okay. help, Vice Mayor? That's right. Yeah, that That's first right. the first motion was for the time. This motion is for the, the information and that fourth bullet point. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. So your vote is yes, Vice Mayor? Yes. Okay. Mayor Anderson. Yes. Commissioner Cunningham. Yes. Commissioner Hess. Yes. Commissioner Pradel. Yes. Commissioner Urban. Yes. Thank you, commissioners. That motion passes. And now, just since you're continuing to clarify, so what are we voting on now, Attorney Robinson? This is the resolution to grant the uh, certificate as you just amended it. Is that clear to everyone? Is there any, any more discussion about that? Seeing no one, is that, am I understanding that right? Okay, so seeing no one, I guess I just do, I, I just, I, I wanna reinforce just before we make this last vote uh, that, you know, 
I don't want anyone to leave from observing this discussion to think that somehow, you know, any of the information that was provided, for example, Commissioner Pradle, you know, talking about, you know, his concerns and verifying that in any way just takes away from the fact that I think every single person sitting on this, uh, you know, group of public servants is very, very uh, concerned and interested in making sure that that it's what's done is done right for everyone that lives in the city of Kalamazoo. And so I appreciate all our discussion and I appreciate that we can have, you know, the trust between us to have those kind of discussions in, in order to get where we're where we at tonight. So thank you so much. Uh, Clerk Borling, will you please call the roll? Commissioner Pradle. Yes. Commissioner Urban. I don't see Commissioner Urban. I don't see him. There you go. Let's we'll still have let's, quorum. Maybe he'll catch in here in a minute. Want to keep going? Yeah. Vice Mayor Griffin. I, I wanted to say something before we took this vote. Um, I'm sorry. That That's okay. I just wanted it to be clear to the community that this project is still going to happen regardless of, I, I just want that part to be clear that this build it was already, that was already going to happen. So what we're talking about is any tax abatements associated with this. It's, I don't know. I just wanna make sure that we're clear on that part, um, that this vote does not mean that we're voting for graphic packaging to do this build. They're already doing that. Um, so yes. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Mayor Anderson. Yes. Commissioner Cunningham. Yes. Commissioner Hess. Uh, yes. And I don't Looks see Commissioner, like Commissioner Urban. Urban is not back. And uh, I'm not sure. Urban we need to... is, Commissioner Urban is having, um, he's listening in, but he's not able to. And for, uh, I don't know if this is, uh, for the clerk, but he just informed me that his vote is yes when you just called him. Uh, is that possible, Attorney Robinson? No, I didn't okay. think so. He's 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 not All right. on the meeting, and so no, he's 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 not able to participate. Okay, so yes, I will right. urge Commissioner Urban to continue to try to connect again. But so those of us present have voted in the affirmative. So this motion passes. Commissioner Hess. Uh, and uh, just back to Vice Mayor's point, this doesn't mean that Graphic is not going to be paying any taxes. I'm sure they're gonna be paying their full share of taxes. Is that correct, uh, Antonio? Yes, yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. We're not voting to have them tax free. Correct. You're not voting for them to be tax free. Yes. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much. Now we are on just a fantabulous and uh, a little less complicated item on our regular agenda H3. Manager Risma. Adoption, adoption of a resolution approving a plan to expand voting and registration access for the November 3, 2020 election. Uh, Clerk Borley, do you have a report on this motion? I do. I just want to kind of go over the resolution, highlight the different elements uh, so that commissioners and the public can see. I'm going to attempt to share my screen here. Well, I guess I can't. Okay, um, but what I want to start by saying is uh, coming up on this November 3rd election, our goals are pretty simple. We want to encourage voting. We want people to vote. And while they do that, we want to keep voters and our poll workers safe. So um, in the end, if we can do those things, our ultimate hope is that they'll, that 
we can, as much as it lies within us, build confidence in our voting process. Um, I just want to uh, say that um, we are being helped in our efforts here, um, my office, voter advocacy groups, by the passage of Proposal 18.3 by voters in November of 2018 uh, that amended the uh, Michigan Constitution to provide some um, ad additional uh, expanded services. Some are mandated and then some are optional. Some, um, the, the, that constitutional amendment gives local clerks some options. Um, some of the, the big provisions that you've heard about is no reason absentee voting. Now you don't have to have a reason to request an absentee ballot. Uh, the close of registration deadline was shortened from 30 days prior to the election to 15, so 15 days, so people have more time to register to vote. Uh, the constitutional amendment also required that clerks have absentee ballots available to the public 40 days prior to the election. Uh, coincidentally, that 40 days is this Thursday. Um, and so there are some, some required mandated parts of that constitutional amendment that um, already are increasing options for voters in terms of how they cast their ballots. Um, and then, uh, of course, one of the, the big ones, too, is election day registration. Uh, we talk about the close of registration being at 15 days, but that doesn't mean that your ability to register to vote is over. It just changes um, some of the rules. Now you have to register in person at your local clerk's office, but you can do that through election day. And if you do that, you can get a, an absentee ballot in person at your clerk's office. So. Um, Proposal three did those things. There were two elements of proposal three that are optional. So it, it gave clerks the ability to do this, uh, but it wasn't a requirement. And one of those is that clerks could offer expanded hours for voter registration and absentee balloting. And the second one is that they can offer additional locations where that is done. Um, the we are going to be um, implementing now some of these optional, or we would like to implement some of these optional um, elements of proposal three. One of them, uh, and now we'll get into the resolution. One of them is to have a uh, a satellite location or a branch office of the clerk's office at Western Michigan University. This would be located at the Bernhard Center. Um, and uh, the even though it's on the campus of Western Michigan University, it would be available to any voter. Any city voter would be able to go there and register to vote, get an absentee ballot. If they have an absentee ballot that they voted, they could drop it off there. Um, one of the main goals of doing this is to encourage voting among students and also to reduce, um, hopefully reduce the lines that we usually see uh, at the Bernhard Center on election day. There are two voting precincts that vote there. And um, especially in larger elections like presidential elections, the longest lines at city precincts um, are always at the Bernhardt Center. Um, and then we saw in March with the presidential primary, one of the first larger elections where we had election day registration at City Hall, we saw long lines um, of mostly students who came to City Hall to register to vote. So we're hoping that by offering the satellite location on campus um, for an extended time, we'll be there almost a month, that that will give a good opportunity for students to be able to register to vote, to get an absentee ballot, and to, to take care of that, uh, that business uh, well in advance of election day. So that's, that's one of the things that, uh, that uh, I'm asking for in this resolution. Um, the other, the, the next thing is some expanded voting hours. Currently, our public hours here at the clerk's office are 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. Starting on October 5th, which is also the day that our satellite location is scheduled to open up. The open office hours will be from 9 a.m. 
to 5 p.m. And we'll carry those hours through until the Friday prior to the election. In the month of October, we're going to have two nights, October 17th, I'm sorry, October 19th, which is a Monday, and it's the close of registration, that 15-day close. We're going to be open till 9 o'clock. We'll also be open to 9 o'clock on Tuesday, the 27th of October. That's one week prior to the election. So we're going to have, uh, between those two days, eight hours of evening office hours where we're open. We're also going to have two Saturdays that we're open. The two Saturdays prior to the election will be open 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. And all these hours that I'm talking about, they're the same for both our city hall office and, and the uh, branch office at Western. So we have, some, we have the branch office at Western. We have some additional office hours. All this year, we've been trying to promote absentee voting. And one of the ways that we're going to be doing it for November is that we're going to be offering prepaid postage on the absentee ballot return envelopes. Uh, the Secretary of State has a reimbursement program for us to do this. So we're going to take advantage of that. And we are adding, uh, you know, putting first class stamps on all of the absentee ballot return envelopes. So a voter can return their absentee ballot via mail and no cost to them. The final um, provision in terms of this November is we hope to be able to install four additional ballot drop boxes. We installed our first drop box behind City Hall just before the May election, and that has been very well received. Um, for the August election on election day, we received back almost a thousand ballots on election day. And of those thousand ballots, between seven and eight hundred of them came through that drop box behind City Hall. So that's been a great addition, a great um, option for voters and we'd like to expand that. Um, now we are, it's, it, there's been a lot of moving pieces to get uh, those drop boxes. Um, we've had to deal with issues of availability, well, whether they'll get here in time, funding, um, and those sorts of things. We have not actually identified uh, locations for those drop boxes yet, um, but I can report that we actually got those boxes delivered in the mail um, at the very end of last week, which is about three weeks ahead of when they told us we would be getting them. So that piece has fallen into place. And now it'll be a matter of identifying the locations and getting them installed. So we hope to be able to do that um, for this election. Um, and that that's an exciting thing that will make returning absentee ballots um, easier people who are uh, concerned about the postal system, whether um, the post office will be able to handle the volume of ballots uh, and so on. Uh, they'll have um, those options, those, those uh, drop boxes to, um, to return their ballots in. So all said and done, the cost for these different uh, initiatives is around fifty-six thousand dollars, and that and that's a combination of uh, equipment costs, like the the drop boxes, but also staffing hours uh, for the the satellite location, for the extra office hours, and so on. Um, and I'm pleased to report that uh, I've applied for a grant through the Center for Tech and Civic Life, and uh, the city has been awarded that grant, which um, the actual the total grant amount is uh, close to $219,000. It will cover the costs of the initiative described in the resolution. It will also help us make sure that we have all of our polling locations staffed uh, the way we want them to be, that we'll have um, personal protective equipment um, for our poll workers, for voters, that uh, we'll have an staffing in my office to deal with this record number of absentee ballots that we're going to be dealing with. So um, so there's, there's two items here. There's the resolution, which is the item before you now. The next item is the acceptance of that grant uh, to fund the um, the initiatives in the resolution. 
Um, so that that's it for my presentation. Um, I do want to thank Commissioner Pradle for helping me develop the resolution and um, giving me feedback on it. And um, he, he met with um, uh, representatives from voter advo advocacy groups like We Vote, Voters Not Politicians, NAACP, League of Women Voters, and, and got their feedback. And these are important partners to us. Um, and so I really appreciate Commissioner Pradle's work and, and help on this and, and uh, those groups as well. I appreciate um, the, the partnership we have with them. If uh, there are any sure. questions, um, I'll be happy to answer them. Sure. Uh, great work, amazing work, Clerk Borling. You, you, uh, you never fail to impress all the time. I really appreciate it. Yep. Uh, Commissioner Pradle. Uh, would you mind describing some of the, the post-election activities as well? Um, Yes, thank you. Um, didn't mean to forget those. There's a lot to try to cover, but um, as I just said, a lot of these initiatives right now are being covered through grant funding. I think we really need to take an opportunity after this election's over to reach out to the community more. Um, some of these resources became like the grant and some um, some talent, some some experienced uh, election administration uh, talent became available to us only recently. And so we're moving forward with these initiatives because um, we think they'll be good for voters. Um, but as we think long term, I, I'm always thinking about what's sustainable, what's repeatable, how can we keep doing this and um, you know, I mean, I found out about the grant funding just about the middle of August. Um, you know, how, where can we find the resources so that we can make this part of our regular election work? And so we need to have a conversation, I think, with the community to find out, first of all, of these things that we're intending on doing, what worked, what didn't, um, where, you know, where is there a need where we could use to put some more resources um, and then, you know, figure out what, what that need is and then have, have a discussion about, um, uh, you know, what that looks like when you have limited resources and, and those decisions that need to be made. Um, and uh, you know where where we want to go from here, because because I'm I'm really interested in saying how can we sustain this, um, and and what is it that the community wants and needs. So um, after the election, we'll have a, a public forum to to get some input feedback on uh, on the election um, and what what happened and, and what worked, what the community would like to see more of, and so on. And then I hope in the first half of next year to really kind of look at this and all of our resources for election administration, um, what what we're doing, what we'd like to do, what we've heard from the community and, and bring it all together and and say, here, this is this is what we'd like to do here. Here are the costs. This is what it would take to do it. And then have that discussion about about how we move forward with that. Any other questions for Clerk Bowling at this point? Uh, seeing none. Seeing uh, just one comment, uh, Clerk Borling, we are so fortunate in Kalamazoo, and I don't know if the people of Kalamazoo know how how fortunate we are to have you and your staff, and, and your staff, uh, um, uh, the support of everyone in your office, um, uplifting the voting process in Kalamazoo. Um, what do the people of Kalamazoo want? I think the people of Kalamazoo want to be heard and voting is probably the biggest way that they can. So thank you for expediting that. Uh, Commissioner Pradle, thank you for your work on this. Um, this is important. Um, one question for you, Clerk Bowling, is um, I've asked it before, but uh, how are we with staffing for this election? Are you set for staffing and do you need any help from anybody? At this point, uh, I think we're doing okay in terms of um, in terms of my office staff, which 
Uh, I have to give them big kudos. My staff was in the, uh, in the office all weekend, um, taking delivery of absentee ballots and organizing them. Um, and then, uh, we have about 16,000 ballots to get in the mail by Thursday. And today, uh, we got about 6,000 of them ready. So my, my staff and, and, and some people who are helping, um, they're doing great work. Uh, at, at this point, I think we're okay. In terms of poll workers, uh, we have seen, oh, I'm going to say 40 to 50 applications for, for poll workers come in in the last couple of weeks, which is tremendous. Um, and at this point, at least on paper, uh, a lot of our, most of our positions are filled. We're actually starting to um, ask people if they're willing to be on an all on call list because we know uh, historically that as we get closer to an election, there'll be people that drop out for this or that reason. Um, and so um, I, I, I hesitate to say, yeah, fine, we're all good. We're no problems at all um, because you know, I know that can change. So if people are still interested, we can put them on a list. We're also reaching out to um, our uh, fellow clerks out there in the county to see who has needs. That if, if people are coming um, and if, if they say, well, no, I, I really want to work. I don't really be, want to be on an on-call list. Uh, we're trying to find out who, um, who else might need some good workers and uh, and that. So I, I think I, I appreciate the question, Commissioner Hess. Um, and, and like I said, I, I really hate to, <laughs> I hesitate to say we're all good because um, I don't want it to come back on me. But, uh, but at this point, we do have a lot of our positions filled. Any more questions for Kirk Brown? Seeing none, the recommended action is a motion to adopt the resolution, is there a motion? Still move. I see, well, I'm gonna say, I saw Commissioner Cunningham, you're making the motion, right? Is that right? Yes. Okay, yes. And, and who else was that? Commissioner Urban? Support, okay. Yeah. Any, any more discussion? Commissioner Cunningham. Um, I just wanted to thank uh, Commissioner Prado for this project and taking the time out of his schedule to uh, push this agenda forward. Um, I can't tell you what it means to, you know, dot the I and cross the T. Uh, and I'm sure that the community at large probably will never understand uh, some of those sacrifices that it takes to get to that component. Um, but I truly, truly, truly appreciate it because this is one of, you know, individuals having the ability to vote is one of the most important things that I uh, appreciate um, about our democracy. Um, being able to put in some type of voice somewhere, some way, some shape, somehow. Um, and so uh, for the work that you and uh, uh, Clark Borley, the leadership that you guys have uh, presented in this place and space, I truly appreciate it. I just want to make sure I completely verbalize that to you. Thank you, Commissioner Thank you. Cunningham. Other, other discussion on the motion? Commissioner Fredo. Hey, thank you um, everyone for your comments. Um, you know, I just think this is the most exciting thing ever. You know, this is what makes me just totally nerd out about being a commissioner mm -hmm. is doing this kind of work. And, you know, some of my fondest memories are being wrapped around the Spring Valley gym, uh, you know, waiting to vote with, with my mom or my dad and you know, going to the end and, and, and talking to them while we're waiting and talking to the people be in front of you or behind you waiting to vote. And I guess I just wanted that to be a reminder you know, during this time for people who have kids or are taking care of role models for kids to use this opportunity, even if you're voting from home, even if you're going to one of the Dropbox locations or however you're exercising your right to vote this November 3rd, to please involve your kids and get them excited about it. And, remind them about how important this is so we can instill a culture in our community that, that uh, voting is something special and very sacred. Um, you know, the thing that I love about voting is that whether you're the billionaire of graphic patch, packaging or whether you're an 18 year old who just is voting for the very first time, who's, you know, grown up from basically nothing, you know, your vote is just as equal to each other. 
you know, that power balance is, is right there with each other. And that's, that's a really powerful thing. I wanted to, you know, just echo and, and reinforce this. I would go, I, I would, I would bet that you will not find a city clerk and a deputy city clerk and a clerk staff that is any better than ours in serving this community. They are second to none. Um, they are working their tails off. They don't complain about it. You, you go in their office and it's just like a beehive, just getting the work done, just doing the grind, getting it done. Um, and they always make the time to listen um, and, and be accessible. And, and to that, I want to, you know, just echo, um, you know, Jessica Schwartz from Voters Not Politicians. She, she was just a bulldog when it came to this whole thing. And, you know, just stay, staying on this and staying focused on it. Um, Wendy Field from NAACP, thank you, you know, for her advocacy work and work uh, as well with the clerk's office. Uh, Denise um, Keel from We Vote, um, you know, she's been advocating on, on behalf of students in the university and, and um, getting students involved. And then Fran Eckenrode from League of Women Voters, you know, all those individuals, um, you know, just care so passionately about this work and have stayed, you know, really engaged with that. Um, you know, and then, and then just, I would just really echo, you know, you're going to start to see communications out there to communicate about the special satellite location hours, the clerk office special hours where they're going to be open till nine o'clock. So you have multiple shifts of people getting off work who can now vote. But please, you know, if you're a community member, if you have a megaphone in this community, whether you're the media or an individual, please share those opportunities uh, as best as you can to help get out the words. So we make sure that they're, 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 those are used by people. And then, you know, I just think the one thing that uh, I hear a lot of times from people is they say, you know, why do we as a community, why do we as Kalamazoo always wait to say like, you know, well, let's see how Grand Rapids does with this first, or let's see how Lansing does with this first. But this is one of those activities and opportunities where we have the opportunity to be a, you know, statewide leader, to have one of the most comprehensive and aggressive voter accessibility and engagement resolutions uh, to actually do the real work uh, to, to make it accessible for real people in our community than any other place in the state of Michigan. And, you know, this, what we're about to vote on has the potential to make it possible for hundreds of people who otherwise wouldn't have voted this November 3rd, whether it's just because of something as simple as a postage stamp or something as simple as the fact is they don't have transportation to make it downtown to even get to a downtown drop box. You know, this is going to have a real impact in this community. And this is what the work's about. So um, I want to thank all of you and uh, for, for um, you know, hopefully making this possible. Thanks, Commissioner Priddle. Any other discussion? Uh, thank you again, that's hero's work. I appreciate it. Uh, Clerk Borland, please call the roll. Mayor Anderson. Yes. Commissioner Cunningham. Yes. Commissioner Hess. Yes. Commissioner Pradle. Yes. Commissioner Urban. Yes. Vice Mayor Griffin. Yes. Thank you, commissioners, the motion passes. Now we are down to H4, the acceptance of a grant. Manager Ritzma. Acceptance of a grant from the Center for Tech and Civic Life in the amount of $218,869 to support the implementation of a safe voting plan for the November 3rd, 2020 election. Approval of a budget amendment to increase the fiscal year 2020 budget for the city clerk's office by the same amount and authorization for the city clerk to sign all grant related documents. Uh, all right, that's, are you making the motion? <laughs> I'm making a motion. <laughs> all right. Yes. All right, is there uh, support by Commissioner House? Any discussion? See no discussion. Clerk Borling, please call the roll. Commissioner Cunningham. Yes. Commissioner Hess. Yes. Commissioner Pradle. Yes. Commissioner Urban. Yes. Vice Mayor Griffin. Yes. Mayor Anderson. Yes. Thank you, commissioners. The motion passes. Next to reports and legislation. City Manager Ritzman, do you have a report? Yes, Your Honor. I would like to um, just provide an update on the subcommittee and uh, request that the work that the subcommittee identified um, be continued and the subcommittee be allowed to, uh, to continue to, to work on those areas identified. So uh, just real quick on the uh, August 17th, the, biz the city commission approved 
a uh, subcommittee to develop the definition of success for the city's response to public protests, demonstrations, and rallies that can be used to guide the planning and execution of that response. Uh, the report, a report was uh, prepared and submitted by August 28th, and there were five general areas uh, that were identified, guiding principles, definition of success, uh, second, First Amendment assembly, communication strategy, third, protocol for operations planning, fourth, policy training, and fifth, accountability. So the subcommittee really identified some, some areas kind of to jump off from and, and pursue uh, additional work. And so I would like to have the commission consider uh, continuing the subcommittee, assuming the uh, three commissioners or the two commissioners and vice mayor that were on it are in agreement to continue. Um, and the following deliverables would be committed to uh, being brought back to the city commission for discussion at the November 2nd meeting. And those are a clear First Amendment assembly communication strategy and protocol with community stakeholder input that includes accountability and a framework for measuring results against intended plans. Second, improved options to communicate with the public before, during, and after events. And third, proposed guidelines and joint training for media and the city to guide interactions during first, future First Amendment assemblies. So um, I just put forth there uh, those deliverables in addition to those deliverables, uh, the subcommittee would also continue to discuss uh, regulations permitting for events and or vet and venues, uh, defining and measuring accountability, such as after action reviews, and the tactics of KDPS and event participants. Um, there were several recommendations uh, made for managing First Amendment assemblies, so we'd like to continue that work. And, um, and then any additional research and discussion regarding policy 430 uh, that may me need to be amended. So that's my report, Your Honor. Uh, thank you, Manager Risma. So, you know, subcommittee work doesn't necessarily always have to be done by motion. You know, we can sort of assign informally one thing or another, and, and some of us go and do some work. Uh, however, we do that, bring that back to commission uh, to get, I mean, we've got a great deal of work to get done. I think it might be possible we might need to focus a little bit more here and there on areas in subcommittee work. So that all said, we did make a motion when we empowered this committee to do that work. It was uh, kind of a, a time-based uh, and task-based undertaking, and Manager Risma is suggesting to extend that time frame and to expand the tasks. So that all said, uh, are the individuals who agreed to participate, and that's uh, earlier on, it was Commissioner Cunningham, Vice Mayor Griffin, and Commissioner Pradle. Uh, is it clear to you what's being asked? Are you willing to, you know, to continue that work and have us authorize you to do that? Open any feedback. Okay, Commissioner Cunningham looks good. Vice Mayor, I'm seeing your shake your head. Okay, same thing. All right. So do, should we go ahead? Do we need to officialize this in some way? I mean, since we made a motion yeah. the first time, what's that? I'm, I'm sorry. Attorney Robinson? Um, I, I, I think that you can just continue the, the work uh, and unless there's a desire to vote on it. I think you've got consent for the, those members on the committee to go forward. There's been an, a plan outlined by the manager. And so I, I don't know that you need a, a further motion. Okay, I appreciate that. Everybody okay with that? Yep. Okay, sounds great. Thank you, Manager Risma. I appreciate that very much. I have one oh, other thing. Your yeah, Honor. go ahead. I'm sorry. Um, I would be remiss if I didn't uh, acknowledge uh, the great work that Chief Carrie Ann Thomas has done for the city of Kalamazoo um, during her 27 year career, uh, about two and a half years of that as our 
public safety chief. So uh, she will be sorely missed and uh, wish her all the best in her retirement and uh, look forward for Vernon Coakley to take over the reins and, uh, and really uh, continue the great work that the chief has, has uh, begun and uh, look forward to his uh, work in serving our community and keeping our community safe. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you, Manager Rispa. So now is the time uh, to hear from commissioners who wanna make any comments. I'll just go ahead and walk through this. Oh, you wanna start, Commissioner Cunningham? Go ahead. All right. Um, just piggybacking on uh, City Manager Ritzma's uh, comments. Thank you, uh, Chief Thomas, for your service to our community and for loving our community. Um, welcome, um, Chief Coakley. Uh, you know, I made a public statement, but I want to reiterate it in this place and space um, to say that, uh, you know, I'd like for the community, you know, whatever perceptions you may have of them, you know, erase them. Let's work with them and try and figure out uh, how to move forward. Um, but in that same sentence, um, I'm not I'm not asking this, but I'm telling you uh, to the community at large, you know, we have concerns. And if you have a concern, continue to voice those concerns until those uh, needs are met um, and continue to work with us so we, we can get those those concerns um, rectify uh, in the best way possible. So um, I'll just leave that there. Um, also, I have a ask of my colleagues, uh, city staff or anybody in the community at large, uh, I have an individual who, uh, who is being evicted as of tomorrow. Um, and that individual needs help with moving out of this home uh, by eight o'clock in the morning. Um, so two things, he, this individual does not have a place to go. So if anybody uh, has any recommendations, please reach out to me personally. Uh, Facebook tends to be the easiest route. Uh, Eric Cunningham or Eric Blair Cunningham, both of which we'll get to. Uh, and or if you have a truck or would like to be uh, on hand to lend a hand, um, just reach out to me. I'll probably uh, be going to sleep relatively soon. But um, if you inbox me, um, I'll be sure to respond around seven and uh, try to assist this individual around eight o'clock. So um, that is that component. Um, I just wanted to highlight uh, the opportunity to, you know, expand this option to vote. Um, I, I, you know, during a time such as, uh, you know, the virus that we're dealing with, there's a population that's going to be scared to even go into some of these places and it may deter individuals from voting. Um, but expanding these opportunities, I think, are huge. Uh, especially in a time where politics just seems to be getting more and more ugly. Um, you know, you see some of these ads and, and they put a dark tone on things. That's a form of voter suppression. I don't care what anybody says it is. Uh, and so those are the type of things that we need to find ways to um, mitigate um, and, and work through to make sure our community doesn't feel intimidated by any means possible. Uh, so uh, I look forward to, you know, these, these next two months uh, supporting individuals as they, you know, continue this journey to elected office. And, and so um, I definitely want to highlight that. Um, and I think that's all of my notes. Oh, one other thing, I just want to highlight the Foundation for Excellence and what it's doing for our youth right now. Um, it, it, once again, not just the voting world, but in the school world, they are having you know, all type of fits and headaches and it's all hands on deck. Uh, and so the community is trying to find ways to wrap, wrap their arms around, um, you know, our students uh, in any way, shape, form or possible. Um, and for the actual city administration to have a, a form of resource to provide towards that, I think is huge. Uh, to be clear, in 2015, uh, when I first started to serve, we couldn't even have a, a, a conversation about what we could provide it, 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 as it pertains to our community. So, um, you know, it was just only, the only conversation we had and who was around then was Urban and, and Anderson. Uh, only conversation we had was what are we gonna cut next and make sure that it doesn't hurt as much as possible. 
Um, and so to have these conversations, man, are just, it's, it's mind blowing. And it's a completely different uh, thought process uh, that you have now serving versus what you had might have had in 2015. So um, once again, um, thank you to the community who, who invests in this opportunity. Uh, and um, I'm, I'm thankful that we are able to invest in our youth um, because that's probably the place that I want to see most of our investments go. Because uh, essentially most of these decisions that we're making right now affects our youth uh, for the future. Thank you, Commissioner Cunningham. Commissioner Urban? Well, I think I just want to uh, uh, say something uh, complimentary about uh, Assistant Captain Coakley. Uh, uh, he's uh, been right under, uh, under scrutiny very closely uh, over the last few months. And uh, I myself have watched him. And I must say, uh, his courage and, and creativity in dealing with very difficult situations really, really impressed me. I, I think uh, it's hard for me uh, to imagine the kind of stress that he's under. Uh, uh, he has a, a much more complicated role even than, uh, than uh, uh, Captain uh, Thomas had. Uh, so I'm wishing him all the best and I wanna thank him uh, publicly for uh, his creativity and courage that he's shown uh, in, these, uh, in these last few months. That's it. Thank you, Commissioner Urban. Commissioner Pradel? Yeah, I just wanted to echo um, others and just uh, thank uh, Chief Thomas for her leadership. Um, you know, a lot of people don't realize also she's a veteran, um, served in the Army. Um, and so she's got a long legacy of, of, of serving our country, but also serving her community. Um, and, uh, you know, there's never been a doubt in my mind, you know, my interactions with her that um, she, you know, worked from before dawn or, uh, you know, before dawn and past dusk many nights. Um, and it was very much from a love and care of this community. Um, and I don't think people also realize how many roles she played in public safety uh, and with the city over her career at 27 years. So I uh, definitely want to thank, thank her for that and her service. Um, and then for um, soon to be Chief Coakley, um, I am a big Bronco fan. And I never realized that apparently uh, soon to be Chief Coakley was part of the 1988 MAC championship team that went on to uh, one of the first bowl games that the university played. And so um, I didn't realize those roots, but I definitely know that it, it uh, shows in his um, commitment to relationships and team building and the importance of like team and how community has to work together with public safety to solve these problems. And then, you know, I just, just as an observer, you know, um, I, you know, he just is, is so committed to being in the community and accessible and talking to youth and kids mm -hmm. and coaching and um, I think that's going to be so necessary right now, um, it, you know, as we, we heal and move forward um, and work together to, to solve uh, the issues that we face. Um, so thank you for um, willing, your willingness to step forward. And, and thank you, Jim, for uh, making that appointment as well. Um, and, you know, I'm just going to echo this again. Um, you know, I'm sharing this to you, Jim, because I don't think um, we say enough thanks to you, um, but to you and the entire, you know, um, city manager staff, and again, to the city staff as a whole, um, these are, are difficult times. You know, you just think about your own personal life and how much your life, just your life, when you don't add your career and you don't add, you know, your hobbies and all those different things, how hard the last six months have been, you know, um, to, to, to function and, and to persevere. And when you think of all the things that the city has been through, all the initiatives that we've accomplished, uh, whether it be, you know, addressing marijuana, whether it be uh, equitable housing, um, you, you and your team have consistently stepped up. Um, and the thing that's remarkable to me is, you know, there have been some incredibly tense and difficult moments and times, but, you know, the thing is, is that you have never lost your cool um, that I've seen um, and have always, um, you know, been willing to just kind of take it. And, you know, however we move or push or, or, or deviate from the original plan, um, you try to find a way to make it work for us. And um, so just I want to let you know that it just doesn't go unnoticed. And uh, it's very much appreciated, um, at least on my behalf, um, you know, that, um, you know, I recognize how difficult these times are, um, you know, and, and I keep saying this to anybody, you know, it's easy to throw arrows. But if anybody's ever led through a, a global pandemic, please raise your hand if uh, you've ever uh, 
were are still leading during a time of uh, great, uh, you know, racial divide and strife, um, please again raise your hand. You know, if you've uh, lived during a time where you've seen unprecedented uh, gun violence in the community, you know, again raise your hand. And when you add all those things together, these are not easy times to figure this out. And there's not a lot of playbooks to look to, and to point to and say, shoot, how do I get this done? So, you know, we're going to take risks. We're going to make mistakes. Um, and we're not always going to get it right. But as long as the heart's always in the right place, I'm good. As long as we keep moving forward and keep striving for, um, you know, continuous improvement and making this community a safer and better place. Um, so uh, thank you to you and your team. Um, and I do mean that your entire team, um, you know, the whole deputy city manager team have all been, we're just working around the clock as well. Uh, we really appreciate you guys. Thank you, Commissioner Pradel. I really appreciate your comments also. Uh, Commissioner Hess. Amen, Chris. Thank you for saying that. I, I echo your comments uh, for uh, City Manager Ritzma and your entire team. Um, so while we're on this theme of team, um, uh, one of the things I tried to teach my teams was the idea of gratitude. And so the gratitude for me tonight is for the Foundation for Excellence. The learning pods are awesome, but the things that the foundation is doing in this community are often unseen and unknown. Uh, but Steve Brown and his team and uh, the great gift that is the foundation um, is, is a tremendous gift to this community and it's gonna help us move forward. Um, uh, gratitude for Carrie Ann Thomas and for her leadership and for her unwavering commitment to this city and her love for this city. So thank you, Carrie Ann. Uh, I know that your officers uh, followed your lead, um, respected your lead, and uh, we are going to miss you dearly. Um, I ran into Sergeant Mason today and uh, who, who, and congratulations to him and to all the officers who have received promotions in a lot of retirements uh, along the way this summer. So congratulations to all of you and all officers who are serving the city. Thank you. Um, Chief Coakley, Assistant Chief Coakley, uh, soon to be Chief Coakley, I look forward to working with you. I respect you greatly. Your faith is amazing. And, um, especially your faith in this community and this, these people. So um, thank you for your leadership and I look forward to um, moving forward. <clears throat> um, thank you to Sean Fletcher and the Department of Parks and Rec for caring enough about that Martin Luther King statue in Martin Luther King Park. Um, it is made of bronze. Lisa Reinertson was, uh, is the artist and <clears throat> I wanna thank uh, Karen Chadwick for, excuse me, for letting um, the, the folks who care about Martin Luther King Park, uh, that this has happened this summer. In the midst of COVID, we, we had um, the statue uh, cared for and cleaned um, and, and re-waxed so it will uh, weather storms and they, uh, so, so Sean, thank you for having that, um, that, that, monument um, updated and cleaned. Thank you so much for that. Um, and uh, I appreciate, um, uh, again, appreciate Commissioner Pradle's work with Clerk Borling. Uh, I'm willing to drive anyone to a Dropbox. If you don't have a ride to a Dropbox uh, and you don't wanna mail your ballot, call me. Um, let me know at the, at my city, my city email, email me at the city email. Um, and then we are in a time when, uh, as commissioner Pradle pointed out, it's, this is a difficult time. We haven't had the pandemic. We haven't had the political strife and we haven't had this divide, this us versus them, whether it's race or class or, or politics or whatever. I feel like Kalamazoo is big enough yet small enough to do this work together. And that's the work of the team. Chief Coakley, you played sports. 
Eric Cunningham, you played. So, uh, we all understand what it's like to be a member of a team. We've got to do this together because in the end, we're looking for a victory and victory means to persevere. So let's persevere together um, and let's get this done. Um, I, I appreciate you all and especially you, Mary Anderson. Um, I, I, the, I don't know if a lot of you know about Ma what Mayor Anderson does, but for a living, he puts people in houses. Um, I was with him in Bronson Park for the homeless event on Sunday, I'm sorry, on Saturday. And during the time I was, this short time I was talking to him, he talked to three people who, who he helped move forward into what could be housing. So um, he is the master of, of uh, housing in this, in this city and he cares deeply about the people of the city. So Mary Anderson, thank you for your leadership in that and um, I'll go. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Hess. Vice Mayor Griffin. Um, yes, just a few uh, quick comments. Um, starting off, I just wanna lift up parents and students at this time. Um, we're still navigating and going through this. So making sure that parents are, you know, taking it easy on yourselves. Um, extending grace to yourself as well as to your children um, as we're all trying to navigate and figure this out and especially to administration and, and teachers as well as we're all trying to figure this out as that's been lifted up that we're in this interesting space, space and time um, with what's happening. I also want to lift up um, anyone who's dealing with loss at this time uh, for whatever reason, um, just keeping those folks um, and my thoughts and prayers. Um, I want to uh, echo some of the comments that were lifted earlier, thanking uh, Commissioner Prado and thanking Clerk Borling um, and everyone who was a part of that work to bring that forward. Um, I, that's something that's been months in the making. Um, a lot of people don't realize the things that the things that happen in the work that takes place off the DS, no, not in secret private meetings, but I mean literally the work that it takes to get things done. Um, and so again, thank you to Commissioner Pradle for, you know, kind of quarterbacking this and, and bringing this to fruition and Clerk Borling and your staff um, and anyone else who, who helped to make that possible. Um, I also, oh yeah, to, and to reiterate how important voting is, um, <clears throat> to go along with that. It's always important, um, especially especially now. Um, so thank you for making it that, that much more accessible to folks. And just to share a few things. Um, so for me, this work, um, there have been different points in my life that I've done different, different pieces of work, whether it be the signs or with this housing ordinance. And I've come to realize over these years that for me, it's about systems change. Um, and, and that's what that I'm, I'm interested, that's where my passion is, is about systems change. It's not about individuals at that given moment being in the spaces, although that does help, um, but it's about the, the whole, right? And so as we're, we're in these systems that are working exactly the way that they're supposed to, and we're having conversations about environmental racism or you know inequities in, in housing or issues of law enforcement and so on and so forth. These are the things that we have to keep focusing on and the things that we have to address if we're going to have different conversations in two to five years. Um, and so I just wanna make sure that I, that I let that be known um, that that is, that is where my heart is at in this work. Um, also, I would like to, to lift up, um, hopefully uh, with, with all that has happened with graphics packaging and, and the amount of, for a lot of folks, this wasn't new. Their health issues, their, the things that they've been going through, it's not new whatsoever. But with folks' new interest in this issue, I'm hoping that, and this is something that shouldn't have to be um, ordinanced or mandated, um, but that some organization, whether an organization who may have responsibility um, to some of these conditions, but that someone reaches back into the people 
and, and starts to work with, with folks um, with their everyday issues while, you know, months and years will go by before things happen. Um, you know, yeah, I, I just hope that someone takes that step forward very much sooner than later and shows in action that they're concerned about the people. Um, and, and to my final point, um, just to address one of the comments that came through or a few of the comments that came through in terms of, you know, having businesses here in Kalamazoo, what I hope that people will understand is that we are going to become a community that's welcoming for all. And if you wanna have a business here, you're going to have to be welcoming for all. If you're going to own property here and rent, it's going to have to be for all and so on and so forth. So we can really truly have an inclusive community. Thank you. Thank you, Vice Mayor. So it's been another long meeting for us. I'm surprised I was able to hold on this long without calling for a bio break. So maybe that will limit my comments a little bit. I uh, appreciate working with everybody uh, on the whole team here. And I, I also support uh, all the comments that people have made. So I'm not gonna go over that again. Uh, I do wanna say that I, I, I sometimes uh, stand back and think, uh, you know, how did I get to be so lucky? Uh, you know, to live in this time and to meet the people I've met and to get to work with the people I've met. And some of those folks now are, you know, Chief Carrie Ann Thomas, the first female public safety chief here in Kalamazoo, uh, a person for whom I had the utmost respect and someone who I love. And a person who's who's broken new ground and, and I get to be around to witness that. And now I'm going to have the same experience with a new chief that's starting in October, Vernon Coakley, a man who I've gotten to know uh, relatively quickly, deeply in some ways, and a person that I already feel like I have heart connection with. So I, I'm looking forward to that as well. I want to recognize a person who was a pioneer here in town, uh, Ken Sarkozy, uh, the part of the dynamic duo that started Sarkozy's Bakery. Uh, Judy and Ken uh, left their PhD programs way back in 1978 and decided their mission in life was going to be to have a, a craft style bakery in Kalamazoo, a downtown Kalamazoo that was you know, virtually empty after five o'clock when they got started and uh, started to bring that work of doing uh, local ingredients and homemade kind of products and all that focus before it seems like that's what everybody wants to do now. So uh, Ken, you will be missed. Ken also spart uh, spent a good part of his career working at ministry with community just half a block away uh, from where their bakery was and after his retirement went back in the bakery. And I always liked going down there and seeing Ken in the back and giving him a shout out. And I know I, I won't be able to do that. Uh, thinking about Judy quite a bit uh, and appreciating them, all the people that make a community be what it is. So thank you for that. It means a lot. Um, I do wanna remind folks, uh, Commissioner Cunningham, that there is a eviction diversion program in town Sorry to say that I don't think I'm about to pull up a miracle on this one, but if we can get, you know, just encourage people as early as you can in the process, get in touch with Housing Resources Incorporated or the, or the United Way uh, through the continuum of care there. There are resources available to assist with eviction diversion or, or help a person uh, during that time frame, so that eviction process does take a minute, can take you know a couple months. Uh, obviously, that's been somewhat extended uh, with the prohibition that occurred during COVID. But there are resources. I want to make sure that people are aware of that, and and uh, we can help folks take advantage of that. I get uh, just to close that all out. I, you know, I want to recognize you know a, a profound loss for our entire country, 
that happened this week. It, it was, I guess, even though it's just some way we would expect it, but it also came as a shock. And that, that's the loss of, uh, of RBG, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, another a groundbreaking person, you know, who uh, was an example for so many people here in the country and her loss is profound. And I've been reading a lot about her more lately, uh, but obviously even more so just in the few days uh, now that she's been and uh, one, uh, she is another, uh, I, I use some language about the vice mayor and her work about being a monument to persistence here locally. Uh, well, uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg was a monument to persistence uh, over work that stretched out over uh, 50, 60 years and being committed to that work. And uh, for, for all the things that I know we're concerned about and can we come back and can this place be a better place or is it, uh, you know, do we have the values to do that? I just wanted to uh, quote her uh, from uh, uh, actually an interview that she gave back in, I think it was 2014. So I, I'm just gonna uh, quote uh, her. She says, the genius of this constitution, let me see the light here. The genius of this constitution is that over the course of now more than two centuries, we the people has become more and more inclusive. Uh, so it includes people whose ancestors were held in human bondage. It includes Native Americans who were not part of we the people when the charter was ratified in 1789. And the end in 1920, half the population women were brought within the polity through the 19th amendment. And it's that the belief that those words, you know, and what, who was included in those words when it was written and not have the capacity to ever grow and include everyone as they should. So please, let's do that together. Let's include everyone in our dreams and our visions as we work forward here. Uh, Kalamazoo to do that. Let's keep our hearts open. I love you, Kalamazoo. We are adjourned.